Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever the time is for you. My name is Sofia Wojcicka and I would like to welcome you to the 10th Genealogies uh, of Memory Conference to the fourth panel, which is uh, entitled Over Looking the Local Dimensions of the Holocaust, Languages and the Cultural Spatial Politics of Transmission. And I would like to add uh, that uh, this panel was organized by the Jagiellonian University. Uh, the, 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 the session will have the following structure. Uh, it will consist of two parts. First, uh, in the first part, we will have a, a keynote speech by uh, Professor Mindaugas Kwiatkowskas. Uh, and then there will be some time for discussion. And then the second part, we will have a panel with uh, four presentations and, and a commentary. Uh, and, and between those two parts, between the keynote and the, um, and the um, panel, there will be a 15 minutes uh, break. And uh, I, so I was also asked to, <coughs> to, to, to remind you that uh, you can, uh, um, that there is no possibility to, 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 to uh, post direct questions to the, um, to the presenters, but you can do it either via, um, via the chat on Zoom or you can send your uh, questions uh, via email to genealogies uh, at enrs.eu. Uh, <coughs> And the, the questions then will be uh, posed to, to, to the speakers. Um, so um, I, 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 I hope we will have a very, or I'm sure we will have a very fruitful uh, and interesting discussions as this uh, session seems to be very, re really very interesting and, um, uh, and well, intriguing. And now I would like to introduce um, our today's keynote speaker. Um, uh, this is, uh, as said, Mindaugas Kviet uh, Kauskas, and he is a literary a scholar, a writer, and translator. Hello, I can see you now. Uh, uh, welcome <laughs> to our studio. And Mr. Kviet Kauskas received uh, his PhD at the Vilnius University and studied uh, the Yiddish language and literature at the University of Oxford. He has uh, done internships at the Ivo Institute for uh, Jewish Research uh, in, in New York and, as, uh, and at the Yale University. And for many years, he worked at the Institute of Lit Lithuanian Literature and Folklore in Vilnius. And he has been the director of this institute in the years, uh, for 10 years, in the years 2008, 2018. And uh, his main areas of research are multinational uh, liter uh, literary modernism and urban culture in Lithuania and uh, East Central Europe. And Mr. Kwiatkowskas is uh, the author of numerous books, including two academic monographs and also uh, a collection of poetry. And he is also translator from Polish, Yiddish, and Yiddish, and uh, his uh, translations uh, include uh, works by Czesław Miłosz, Abraham Sutzkever, and uh, 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 the diary of Itz Itzhok uh, Ra uh, Radaszewski, he will be talking uh, about today. And um, uh, last but not least, since uh, last year, 2019, Mr. Kwiatkowskas is uh, serving as Lithuanian Minister of Culture. Uh, and he, today he will be talking that the keynote will be titled Local Addresses in Holocaust Diaries, Reconstructing the Life Worlds of Young Jewish diaries, uh, Diarists in uh, Vilnius. Um, Mr. Kwiatkowskas, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, <coughs> real pleasure to take part in this conference and it's a real pleasure to collaborate with the European Network um, Remembrance and Solidarity. Uh, many thanks and greetings for the entire team, for Director Rafał Rogulski, serdecznie życzenie i pozdrowienia dla wszystkich kolegów z Polski, z Warszawy i z Krakowa. As a Minister of Culture, I would uh, 
like to emphasize at the beginning of my keynote speech um, our interest to participate uh, in the activities of the uh, network. We've been in touch for already, for, for already some time uh, and uh, we were considering uh, the uh, opportunities, the possibilities of joining the network as an observer country. And I must um, uh, state that uh, we really embrace these opportunities. We have large interest from uh, Lithuanian institutions, research centers and museums. And I really hope uh, that uh, in the coming months we will be uh, able to start uh, with the agreement about Lithuania joining the network as an observer country. And I hope that uh, this will be a beginning of a very fruitful and a long-term collaboration. Now I will turn to my um, presentation. Um, and um, a bit later, uh, I will um, uh, ask to switch the presentation to, to another one. Uh, now you can see uh, pictures from the book, images from the book by uh, Itzhak Rudashevsky, a young diarist uh, from uh, Vilnius, uh, which I have translated then into Lithuanian, uh, into Lithuanian language, and this publication appeared in 2018. Uh, it is a bilingual Yiddish-Lithuanian edition um, designed by a famous Lithuanian book artist, Sigute Klebenskait, and published by the Lithuanian um, Jewish community. Uh, I will be speaking about Itzhak Rudashevsky, his biography and um, uh, diary, and uh, the meaning of Rudashevsky's uh, legacy as a site of memory in contemporary Vilnius, Vilnius about the forming of a site, site of memory. Later on, I will uh, also discuss uh, such meanings by another young diarist, diarist, young Holocaust diarist, Matilda Olkinaide. The cultural memory of the Holocaust started forming in Lithuania after several long, long decades of silence, after the repression of the historical traumas suffered by all communities, Jews, Lithuanians, Poles, during the Soviet occupation. This process of memory development brought to the public spotlight not just the shocking facts of World War II that had long been suppressed or distorted, and not just a multitude of tragic personal experiences and autobiographic, uh, autobiographical testimonies. Many specific locations in Lithuania cities and regional areas that possibly had until then been totally anonymous abandoned and lacked any special cultural semantics, also acquired a new symbolic significance. These processes of the emergence of new sites of memory and development of their narratives have been particularly intensive during the last decade. As a researcher and translator of Yiddish literature, I have participated in a number of such processes that combined documentary uh, Testimon testimonies of the Holocaust with the giving, giving of meaning, of new meaning to specific places in the city of Vilnius and elsewhere. For instance, in 2014, as a translator of Jewish poetry, I organized a reading of Yiddish literature in the former building of the Vilnius Ghetto Library. This was the first time it took place here since the Holocaust. At the time, this building was still an abandoned ruin and today its reconstruction has already started in order to turn it into, into a modern museum of Vilnius Ghetto's history, and I hope it will happen after a few years. As a Minister of Culture, I'm currently participating in the construction of a new monument, which is to, to be built in Vilnius and which will be dedicated to the rescuers of Jews in the Nazi-occupied Lithuania. Next year, it will emerge in a picturesque and popular location of the city, which has not been associated with the Holocaust before, even though historically it was where the last selection of the Vilnius ghetto prisoners uh, during its final liquidation took place. Nevertheless, this process of giving or restoring meaning to spaces is not unambiguous. 
it often involves the task of combining narratives that are different, that had been established in the past and are being constructed anew, that are canonical or revoke the cultural memory, that belong to different communities and invent that are contradictory internally. One of the greatest challenges in the development of sites of memory are the testimonies from an atypical perspective. For instance, diaries of the children and young adults of the Holocaust, as we all know, known from rich and outstanding research at those sources, including the research of one of the participants of this uh, panel, Professor Sue, Sue Weiss. And uh, I think that uh, Sue Weiss, in her book, Child Children Writing the Holocaust, very uh, uh, precisely uh, formulates the challenges of these texts. I would like just to quote from this book uh, about the, the characteristics of these uh, children diaries of the Holocaust. So I quote, the familiarization, errors of fact and perception, attention to detail at the expense of context, loss of effect, indefinite or divided temporality, irony of various kinds, the confusion of developmental and with historical events, charged relations between author, narrator, and protagonist, and age-specific concerns with the nature of writing and memory. I will also speak about the challenges presented by, the, by such texts uh, in, um, uh, in the Lithuanian context, in the context of Vilnius urban space. And I will discuss the formation of a site of memory which is taking place in modern Vilnius and which is related to the diary written in the Vilnius ghetto by a 14-year-old Jewish boy, Itzhok Rudashevsky, and to the unique biographical narrative of its author, born in 1927 and killed in 1943. Uh, at the uh, end of the presentation, I will also draw attention to another parallel process, the formation of a site of memory of Matilda Olkinaite, a young Lithuanian Jewish poet and author of a diary written on the eve of the Holocaust in the space of, in the urban space of Vilnius, which is topographically very close to Rudashevsky. The addresses of these authors' places of residence that I have managed to identify while preparing the publications of their diaries based on the original manuscripts are almost adjacent to each other, uh, to one another. And both of their houses have survived to this day. However, the narratives of their memory sites are significantly contrasting and can even contradict one another. This reveals the multiplicity of meaning of the Holocaust sites of memory in the same urban space. Now, hence my presentation will be an attempt to reflect on the question of what is or could be the significance of these newly emerging sites of memory in terms of a Holocaust memory culture, which is currently undergoing an intensive development process in Lithuania. According to Aleida Asman, the central aim of memory policy across Europe should be a dialogical memory culture, which is open to all kinds of experiences, but at the same time supported with common overarching narratives. On the one hand, the Holocaust diaries written by talented young adults are of major documentary, moral and aesthetic significance and stimulate individual empathy of local and international readers. On the other hand, the texts of both diaries raise acute issues reflecting unresolved conflicts between different memory narratives and inter interpretations of history. Anti-Soviet anti -Soviet versus pro-Soviet opinions of these young authors negative versus positive imagery of their Christian, Lithuanian, and Polish neighbors, and rebellious criticisms of their own Jewish community make these, text, uh, make these texts challenging and problematic memories, memory sites. I interpret these challenges of the young adult's diaries as indicators showing whether the Holocaust narrative in Lithuania is already mature enough to accept the dialogical and pl pluralistic forms of cultural memory. 
Now, in, in this presentation, uh, you, you have been already uh, able to see a Stolperstein, uh, a stumbling stone dedicated to a memory of Itzhak Rudashevsky uh, laid into the pavement uh, uh, on a street of uh, Vilnius. It was laid in August 2016 in front of a former Jewish gymnasium which functioned on, on Rudnika Street or Rudnitskergas or Ulitsa Rudnitska in Vilnius. The Stolperstein bore the following inscription. Here studied Itzhok Rudashevsky, born in 1927, imprisoned in, imprisoned in the Vilna ghetto in September 1941, killed in Ponar in October 1943. The Stolperstein project, as we all know, started in Germany in 1992, and with time it developed into a known practice internationally, a European practice of commemoration. Almost a quarter of a century later, this Stolperstein project reached Lithuania, marking clear changes in the collective memory of the country. At the same time, the laying of a stumbling stone to commemorate Rudoshevsky revealed the specific local nature of this practice and the distinctive local challenges related to it. Now you can see this stumbling stone. The stumbling stone in memory of the boy was laid without even knowing the exact former, his exact former home address in Vilnius. The usual practice is to lay, is to lay uh, stumbling stones in front of a Holocaust victim's home or work address where they last lived or worked as a free person. However, at that time, despite being one of the best known Child, uh, children authors of the Holocaust diaries, Rudashevsky barely existed in the cultural memory of Lithuania and very little was known about him. In his diary, the boy gave an expressive description of the day when his family was expelled from their home and herded to the ghetto in September 1941. Nonetheless, his exact former home address, which is on Pilimo Street, Zavalna Street, Zavalnergas, where a stumbling stone could have been laid was established only in, only in the process of my research related to the translation of Rudashevsky's diary from Yiddish. Uh, at, uh, uh, in 19, uh, in, in um, 2018, as I already mentioned, Rudashevsky's diary was published in Vilnius in two languages, Lithuanian and Yiddish. Uh, and um, um, Already in 2017, excerpts from the diary were included in a school textbook of Lithuanian literature as a source of Holocaust education. So consequently, we can witness how a spot of oblivion that until recently existed in Lithuania over the past two years gave way to an emotionally powerful memory site of the Holocaust, the memory of a world-renowned child who wrote a Vilna ghetto diary and was killed in Ponar at the age of 15. In other words, speaking in Jan and Aleida Asman's terms, Rudashevsky as a historic, uh, historic figure was transferred from the domain of historic archives and communicative memory kept by the Lithuanian Jewish community into a public domain of collective memory. The network of memory culture consisting of public commemoration, testimony, artifacts from the long forgotten past, biographic narrative and education appeared over a short period of time, a very short period of time, and is likely to undergo, to undergo further developments. Uh, this is a raw and fresh material. The books I'm speaking about, Rudashevsky's and Olkinaitis books, have appeared in the recent years, uh, two years ago and one year ago. So this is the process taking place uh, just before our uh, eyes process of uh, forming of these um, uh, narratives and sites of memory. So, um, in my opinion, uh, different interpretations of this diary, both diaries, um, may have uh, an important impact uh, to collective memory narratives of World War II and, and the Holocaust, which, which still continue to compete uh, in Lithuania. Uh, and these interpretations may either contradistinguish these narratives even further or make them geologically closer to each other by finding the common overarching narratives. 
A notebook of Rudashevsky's diary was found in July 1944 in the former territory of the Vilna Ghetto. The diary was hidden in the attic of a house on Disnergas in Yiddish or the Disno Street in Lithuania. There was a hideout installed there uh, in Yiddish land called Malina. The boy, his parents, and his uncle's family were hiding there for 11 days in hope of surviving the final liquidation of the Vilna Ghetto when the last inmates were taken to Ponar onto, or to concentration camps to die. However, in the course of checking the territory of a liquidated, liquidated ghetto, the Nazis discovered the hideout. They drove all the people that we found there to the Gestapo and later shot to death in Ponar. The body of a 15-year-old boy who wrote the diary also lies in one of the burial pits there. The only person who survived from all those who were hiding in the attic was Itzhok's 14-year-old cousin, Sara, uh, or Sore Voloshin, uh, whom uh, I was happy to meet a couple of years ago and to interview her in Jerusalem. Sara managed to escape the execution because of miraculous coincidences and joined a group of Jewish partisans, where she stayed till the front line approach and the Soviet army entered Vilnius on, uh, in July 1944. According to Sarah Voloshin, she returned to the hideout in the evening of that same day to look, day to look for traces of the annihilated family, and in one of the corners of the attic, she found a dirty notebook, which appeared to be the diary of her cousin Itzhok. The first edition of the diary was published by poet Abraham Sutzkever in the Journal of Yiddish Literature, The Golden Cape, uh, in Tel Aviv in, 1940, in 1953. Later, Sutzkever handed the diary over to the YIVO ar archive in New York, where it remains until now. Three versions of the diary in Hebrew, English, and French were published based on the original manuscript, and the Lithuanian Yiddish edition uh, uh, appeared in 2018. Now, what peculiarities of Rudashevsky's diary turn it into a powerful memory site and generate its special narrative in contemporary Lithuania. First of all, I think it's a localization of memory. Until recently, information about Itzhok, his family, and their life before the war was very scarce. But archival research helped to indicate their exact address uh, of their, uh, of their um, uh, homes, of, of their houses, of Itzhok's native home and of their hiding places. Also, um, uh, and uh, the houses still exist and bear the same numbers. Thus, in the process of translating the diary, the exact topographic place of events uh, described in the diary was uh, identified. As a result, history was localized, and Rudashevsky's story was supplemented with the element of space, which is extremely important in, in terms of collective memory. Now, uh, the second reason is the representation of local Jewish cultural tradition. Itzhok Rudashevsky came from an intelligent family directly related to the Jewish cultural life in Vilnius. The boy's father was a typographer of one of the biggest and most influential Yiddish dailies in the city called Vilner Tok, Vilnius Day. His uncle was the administrator of that same daily. The editor of this newspaper was a famous intellectual and literary critic, Zalman Raisin, one of the founders of the YIVO Institute. It was in the Vilner Talk newspaper that Jung Vilne, a group of modernist writers and artists, made their debut and published their manifesto back in 1929. This environment was to a large extent connected with the left political wing, especially Bund, the Jewish Socialist Party. In the ghetto, Itzhok knew poets Abraham Sutzkever and Schmerke Kaczerginski, who were members of, Jung Vilne, of the Jung Vilna Literary Group and cooperated with them in the cultural activities. Itzhok's biographical background, his worldview, and early personal connections with literary sphere allow referring to him as to a successor of local Yiddish culture that flourished in Vilnius and in the interwar period. This makes Rudashevsky's diary extremely important as a representation of annihilated cultural tradition, of annihilated Yiddish cultural tradition. Now, a third uh, feature is the testimony 
the first characteristic making this diary into an important memory uh, site is the testimony of unarmed cultural ghetto resistance. Uh, and um, it's a direct, uh, direct relation, a direct participation of this boy uh, in the cultural uh, activities in the Vilna ghetto. Itzhok was a pupil um, uh, of the re-established Jewish gymnasium in the ghetto, which continued to uh, teach the same pre-war curriculum under inhumane circumstances since 1942. In his diary, the boy wrote about uh, the meaning the school gives to his lives, to his life. The mo most prominent gymnasium teachers served as personal authorities and ideal examples for the boy, uh, such as famous uh, uh, teachers from the Vilna ghetto as Mira Bernstein and Jakob Gerstein. Itzhok also stood on the stage of the legendary Vilna ghetto theater where he read his early literary work for the Vilna Ghetto audience. The symbolic moment was his first public debut. The boy was also a passionate reader of the Vilna Ghetto library. All this makes Rudashevsky's diary a special testimony of a cultural life in the Vilna Ghetto, confirming the meaningfulness of its unarmed cultural resistance. Now, of course, the artistic value of the text. Probably the most important reason for a diary to become a site of memory is that it reveals the undoubted literary and intellectual talent of a young writer, including his artistic approach to extreme reality. Some inscriptions in Itzhok's diary describe images, atmosphere, and inner status rather than events or personal situations from the life of a ghetto, including certain details which were presented as if they were secondary in nature but still extremely eloquent, especially the feeling of local aura by a 14-year-old seems to be phenomenal and proves his exceptional empathy and literary abilities. Uh, I will quote a description of a dark little ghetto street and figures of poor vendors crowding around, around the lit up corner from his uh, diary. He quote, like flies around a little land where ghetto vendors, mostly children, cling to the light. The bluish dull light illuminates the rags of the children or, or women, illuminates the little hands red from cold, which are counting money and giving change. Frozen, carrying the little stands on their backs, they push towards a tiny corner that is lit up. They stand thus until they hear the whistle, and then they disappear with their trace into the black little ghetto streets. Next day, you see them again at the sad light, how they knock one foot against the other and breathe into the frozen hands. End of quote. This description of this scene reminds of more than expressive painting. The specific lightning, coloring, and composition of the scene including certain symbolic associations, gain special importance in the eyes of the viewer. The child presents the scene through his own eyes and achieves an unexpected effect, effect of artistic distance. This is what makes Rudashevsky's diary important in terms of Holocaust education and for the purpose of other artistic interpretations. Its aesthetic value transcends greatly the, positions of, the position of this text in the cultural memory canon. And of course, uh, the sacralization of child's testimony. Obviously, Rudashevsky's diary gains special significance as a testimony of a murdered child, which you know, in its own turn carries a certain sacral meaning. It represent, represents the most innocent and absolute victims of the Holocaust. The iconography of child suffering has become, become one of the central axes in the Holocaust memory discourse. There is no doubt that the figure of Itzhok Rudashevsky, an exceptionally talented boy from Vilnius, who was killed in Ponar, also has this power attached to it, including the potential to become, become an icon 
of a cultural Holocaust memory in Lithuania. However, Rudashevsky's diary is also significant, is, is also a significant challenge for modern Holocaust memory culture, which is currently experiencing, as I have mentioned already, a period of intensive development in Lithuania. On the one hand, the text written by a child in the Vilna ghetto is of major documentary, moral, and aesthetic significance. On the other hand, the text of the diary raises acute issues reflecting a conflict between different memory narratives, between different traumatic narratives and interpretations of uh, history. And first, such, such prob problematic uh, challenge and problematic side of this text is the socialist and pro-Soviet views of the author. Itzhok's views on the socialist system and the Soviet Union were full of idealistic beliefs and hopes for a new and just world and happiness. As I mentioned, he came from a leftist socialist milieu uh, in Vilnius, and uh, uh, his worldview is really affected uh, by the views held of his, uh, his parents and of his family. There is a number of episodes where authentic childish hope and naive perception of socialist and Soviet ideology seem to be inseparably, inseparably intertwined. For example, having found a Soviet proclamation which was smuggled into the ghetto, Itzhok reads it and believes every single word that it contains as if it was a promise of survival, which makes him stronger. Another entry in the diary about an underground festivity uh, held in the ghetto to mark the anniversary of the Red Army serves as another testimony of this com complicated tangle. Uh, Itzhok describes how in absolute secrecy, Stalin's portrait uh, is placed uh, on the table, is demonstrated on the table and he expresses admiration and reverence to this. For contemporary Lithuanian readers, Itzhok's rhetoric and imagery used by him, such as the ritual with Stalin's portrait, serve as culturally alien signs, which create a conflict of memories and a gap between the perceiver and the text, which can only be reduced by getting to know the historic context and through active interpretation, or else it can evolve into a stereotypical rejection. One more complication uh, for the memory narrative is, a, is the negative imagery of Lithuanians. Rudashevsky records and uncondi unconditionally reveals the role of Lithuanian Jew killers who collaborated with the Nazis. In this case, the child's testimony appears to be exceptionally authentic and hurtful. The participation of Lithuanian nationals in the genocide gets recorded in the diary from the start of the horrific events. A very sensitive problem in terms of cultural memory is the fact that, that in Itzhok's diary, the concept Lithuanians is almost always used in the meaning of enemies. When the boy wrote about Germans, he mentioned both the Nazi criminals and several figures of good Germans, uh, Germans who clandestinely helped the Jews. When writing about the locals who were helping and rescuing Jews, Itzhok referred to them as to Christians without specifying their nationality. However, in his diary, the ethnonym Lithuanians is almost solely used to refer to the Nazi helpers. Does the diary impart objective truth about the role of Lithuanian Jew killers? Yet on the other hand, it also con conveys a negative national stereotype. There are several factors that explain the position of the author. First, there was a linguistic and cultural estrangement between the Lithuanians of the interwar period and the Vilnius Jews who allied themselves with the Polish cultural environment. Second, the majority of the Lithuanians were clearly anti-communist, which contradicted, contradicting, contradicted the expectations of the left-wing Jews during the Holocaust. Third, in, uh, in cruel extreme situations, the roles of the perpetrators became deeply entrenched in Itzhak's consciousness and became inseparable from the image of the whole nation. The boy's diary helps to understand 
how and why the negative stereotype of Lithuanians began to emerge. However, it still hurts the Lithuanian mentality and is dissonant with the traditional traumatic narrative of Lithuanians themselves being victims of numerous occupations, which to a certain degree still prevents parts of the Lithuanian society from perceiving the Holocaust memory as our own discourse. The diary once again requires giving it an intensive additional interpretation. The negative collective image in the eyes of a child serves as an extremely strong incentive to make a critical review of our own memory narrative. And third problematic aspect is criticism and deheroization of the ghetto community itself. The diary reveals a paradox which is difficult to accept in the context of a cultural memory that sacralizes victims of the Holocaust. Hitchcock describes victims who had to fight for their life among themselves. The community that lacked inner solidarity and in addition to that, the extreme moral degradation of those who chose to collaborate with the killers of their own nation in hope of surviving at the cost of others. In Hitchcock's diary, Jewish policemen are condemned without any reservations and compared to the Lithuanian police who collaborated with the Nazis. These are especially controversial places in the diary, as in extreme cases they can provoke revisionist, revisionist considerations. On the other hand, they encourage searching for a more complex memory narrative of life in the ghetto instead of an overly heroic one. These aspects make Verdashevsky's diary a problematic memory site, which may stimulate rejection or negative stereotypical reactions and result in an empath empathy gap opening between the text and the contemporary Lithuanian readers. Overcoming the gap requires intensive interpretation of the text with the aim to explain the historic context and the different life world of this child. It seems that as a result of certain differences highlighted by Rudashevsky's text, one simply must admit the non-commensurability and pluralism of memory narratives, which is impossible to eliminate. I would like now to ask for launching the second presentation uh, about Matilda Olkinaitis' diary. I will turn to that uh, diary in a moment. So I think that the only way to avoid the reduction, rejection or censorship of these contradictions is to build overarching narratives of memory on, on their irreducible multiplicity. Now, as an example of such multi multiplicity found in the same space, I would like to turn to the diary uh, and uh, literary legacy of Matilda Olkinaite. Now you, you can see the presentation from the uh, book uh, uh, the Unlocked Diary that uh, appeared in Lithuanian in Vilnius uh, last year, also designed by Sigute Klebenskaite uh, and published by the Lithuanian, uh, by the Institute for Lithuanian Literature and Folklore. Uh, the English publication of this diary is also to be published in the next coming months uh, in Vilnius, translated by Laima Vince. I hope that the English edition of this book is going to appear, uh, appear very soon. And uh, I hope that you, uh, uh, that you are able to uh, leave through another book, another testimony, another diary, and uh, uh, to get the impression of the material uh, I am speaking uh, about. So, Matilda Olkinaite, the author of Another Diary, is a close parallel to Rudashevsky's memorial narrative in Vilnius. At the same time, it is an example of a completely different young person's life world, like a parallel cultural reality of the Holocaust tragedy. Matilda, born and raised in northern Lithuania in the town, in the small town of Panemunelis, in the family of a Jewish pharmacist, graduated from the Lithuanian gymnasium. Later, she studied French language and literature at Vilnius University in 1940 and 1941. From her early youth, she wrote poetry only in Lithuanian, 
which he spoke as well as her native Yiddish. In 1940 and 1941, she wrote a diary in Lithuanian language, the text of which reflects her life in Vilnius during World War II. In those years, when the city was still under the control of independent Republic of Lithuania for a while, but soon was occupied by the Soviet Union. The diary, as in, in the case of Anna Frank, also tells a lot about the intimate life and reveals Matilda's secret love affair with an Anjou, a Lithuanian man. Matilda's cultural environment developed uh, uh, her strong Lithuanian patriotism in this case, which during the Soviet occupation turned into a conscious civic position, outrage against the Soviet system, refusal to collaborate and, and solidarity with the Lithuanian political position. Her native Yiddish, which was spoken in Matilda's home environment, also developed her feelings of Lithuanian of patriotism and opposition to Sovietization, which are clearly expressed in her diary. Unlike Rudashevsky, Matilda resented the collaboration of writers with the Soviet government and mocked the possible method of social realism, although this meant that she needed to bury her hopes of publishing her very first book of poems. In June 1941, after the Nazi occupation of Lithuania, Olkinaite immediately returned to her parents' hometown, but there she and her family were arrested by the Lithuanian collaborators who had helped the Nazis, and soon the whole family was shot. However, a local Catholic priest who for some time hid the Olkinaite family in his pastorate hid the manuscripts of a young Jewish poet under the great altar of the of the Panemunelis church, of the church of her hometown. The manuscripts were unexpectedly discovered only in 1987. After founding them, the anti-Soviet dissident handing the manuscripts to a professor, Irena Weisaite, a prominent Lithuanian intellectual of Jewish origin who survived the Holocaust, saved by Lithuanian families and who still vividly embodies the ideas of tolerance and cultural dialogue between Lithuanians and Jews. Thanks to the efforts of the site and other intellectuals, Matilda's work was started to be published and researched, and her, and her memory was, a gradual, was gradually returned to the Lithuanian public discourse. In 2017, her texts, uh, just as uh, Rudashevsky's diary, were included in school textbooks of Lithuanian literature. Matilda's book, The Unlocked Diary, covering her diary and her literary work, her poetry, uh, as well as a study of archives, revealed very symbolic spatial coincidences. In 1940, Matilda's address in Vilnius was a room in the house at uh, number 16 at Basanavichu Street, or uh, before the war, the, six, uh, the street was called Pohulanka, the Great Pohulanka, famous street in Vilnius. This house was a symbolic place for the history uh, of Vilnius culture. The world famous Jewish historian Simon Dubno lived in this house and also the French writer of Jewish origin, Romain Gary who spent his childhood there. A huge yard of this house, described in Gary's novel, Promised at Dawn, formerly merged into one complex with the adjacent house at the corner, where the YIVO Institute was established in 1925. It was the first headquarters of YIVO Institute. It was established by Yiddish linguistic professor Max Weinreich, who also lived in that house. Moreover, Professor Irena, Irena Weisaite lived and still lives in that same house for many years, and Matilda's manuscripts were handed to her in 1987. So her manuscripts returned after many years to the same place in Vilnius where they, have, where they were written, to the same house, which is important to the Jewish culture, which was home to, for this young poet in 1940. And another important coincidence, in 1941, she lived in the house number 46 at Pilimo Street, as Zavalna Street, uh, and a lot is spoken about this particular space and surrounding streets in Matilda's diary in 1941. 
As I have mentioned, the author of another Holocaust diary, Itzhok Rudashevsky, lived just a few houses away on the same street and wrote about the same place from a totally different cultural perspective and with a different cultural identity. Thus, after archival research, the Holocaust diaries reveal the specific topography of a local urban space and become a whole new complex of symbolic discourse with a varying, contradictory, and very rich cultural uh, meanings. The reconstruction of the life worlds of the authors of the Holocaust diaries may generate and generates new symbolic meanings of these memory places, revealing their multiplicity, their synchronicity, their internal, internal contradictions and their mutual dialogue, and possibilities for new connections, for overarching narratives. The Holocaust memory thus becomes a multiple semantic network and a cultural palimpsest of different stories, mentalities, and attitudes. In this way, the process of healing traumatic memory, the reconciliation of conflicting historical narratives can proceed. And I also think this is the moment where artistic interpretation, artistic building of those overarching narratives from a very rich and pluralistic materials must step in. Thank you for your attention, and I hope we will have a very interesting discussion. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for the very, very interesting um, uh, speech. and. Um, I already, I'm sure it will be a very interesting discussion. I already have, uh, my colleagues here have already put me some questions sent in by, by, the, by, by the audience. And uh, I would maybe uh, read them out to you first. Um, the first is by Magda Heidel, who will be uh, also later uh, one of the speakers of our, um, of the second panel and she, she's associate professor at the Jagiellonian University, also dealing with translation issues. And her uh, question is very specific. She asked if you could comment on the most important challenges and difficulties in translating uh, the children's diaries. And uh, the second question is by Małgorzata Pakier, who is a co-organizer, or the main organizer actually of this conference uh, from the uh, side of the European network. And uh, this is a quite complicated question. I will read it out loud. Thank you for uh, this very interesting lecture, she writes. And I'm interested in the process of transformation of the diaries into symbols of cultural memory, national and possibly transnational memories. Would it be possible to identify stories, narratives that have better potential of becoming icons of contemporary memory cultures and those stories or aspects of them that do not easily undergo such uh, universalization? And uh, maybe I would also add my own uh, question. I, I happen to be... Um, at the Jewish Museum in Vilnius some time ago. And uh, if I remember well, in a way, this uh, uh, the diary of Rudashevsky also entered the, as a lieu de mémoire also into museums, because in the Jewish Museum there is this uh, reconstruction of the Melina, yeah. uh, which is the Melina of Rudashevsky, if I remember uh, uh, well, with a quotation from his yeah. Uh, yeah. diary. Um, but what would be interesting for me would be could you elaborate a bit more about sort of discussions and the perception of well both diaries in 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 uh, after their publication in in Lithuanian in in Lithuania and maybe if you more also more something more about their for previous reception in Israel on in the United States as you mentioned there are many issues were, which are quite difficult, disputable, hurting, uh, uh, the, how he writes about the Poles or the Lithuanians, about collaboration, also about 
the, 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 the ghetto society. So what was the perception or the, 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 to raise any discussions in Lithuania, mm. the publication of this mm. uh, uh, mm. diary? So this would be the mm. first question round. Thank you so much. Um, uh, now the first uh, question by Magda Heidel. Uh, uh, well, it, I think it is also related to the interpretation of the original manuscript. Because, of course, when, when, when you work uh, the original manuscript, at, uh, as was in, in, in both cases of Dashevsky and, and Olkinaitis, you you, go, you 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 uh, you, uh, you must do the uh, uh, primary process on interpretation, interpreting the lacunas, interpreting interpreting the um, um, uh, vague uh, vague, uh, vague vague places, inscriptions on the margins, uh, um, drawings, uh, for example, and um, uh, building. Uh, uh, some kind uh, of a coherent text and uh, uh, i'm really conscious about uh, uh, these different possibilities of interpretation uh, and if, if we compare uh, the uh, uh, translations in different languages by its uh, by, uh, of, of its Rudashevsky's diary for example in, in french and uh, or, or or in english you may see uh, also uh, different uh, different ways of dealing with these uh, lacuna, with these uh, features of uh, manuscripts. Uh, 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 Rudashevsky's and Olkinaitis diary uh, diaries have a very uh, important uh, feature, a unique characteristic. They, they are written uh, by a very uh, um, literary talented children. Uh, their language uh, is really a literary one. So uh, they both have narrations, they both have metaphors. Uh, and in some sense, uh, this text, uh, these texts are uh, really uh, special. So uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, when I was working as a translator, um, uh, it was um, adequate to interpret uh, uh, these texts as having their own uh, continuities and na narratives uh, inside them. Of course, I tried to keep uh, uh, the blank spaces, uh, that fragmentary, um, uh, fragmentary nature of both, both texts. But uh, also, I wanted to uh, show uh, the uh, literary side of both of these uh, these authors. It means uh, that uh, I, uh, by, by choosing my own interpretation, uh, I uh, kept to the notion that these texts are written by young writers, young writers that. Although writing in the very complicated uh, uh, situation, in, in, in an extreme situation, are telling uh, the stories, are telling the stories in a very uh, talented, uh, uh, talented way. Uh, and uh, of course, both publications, uh, both book pu publications, also show uh, the uh, original archival archival materials. Uh, original uh, images, original photos uh, of both diaries, uh, and uh, together with uh, book designers, Sigute Hleb and Skyte, with, with whom we really closely cooperated uh, in the process of preparing these publications, we tried to keep on the visual side the authentic uh, image, the uh, authentic feeling uh, uh, of these texts, uh, of these texts, as um, uh, as good um, uh, as possible. Uh, now, um, uh, about the um, iconization of the diaries, uh, about the iconization of the, and the transferring of these diaries to 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 the universal uh, perception, universal. Um, memory places. 
Uh, I touched upon uh, this a little bit uh, while speaking about Rudashevsky's uh, uh, diary. Uh, there are uh, more diaries by children and young ad adults, uh, adults written, uh, written in the uh, Lithuanian uh, ghettos. Not many more of them, but, uh, but a couple of um, other authors uh, as well. Uh, However, diaries of Olkinaite and uh, Rudashevsky, as I have mentioned uh, before, they are very closely connected, directly related to the cultural contexts and cultural traditions. They are rich in their cultural information. Uh, and uh, they are not just uh, pers personal notings about the personal life, about the uh, facts, about the events uh, in uh, uh, in the author's life. So they, they not only have this personal documentary meaning, they are also testimonies of a community life, of a cultural life uh, in which both authors participated. And well, Matilda Olkinaite was already a debuting poet. Her, her poetry was uh, published before the Holocaust in the Lithuanian press. So uh, uh, she had this... Uh, very specific status of a young Jewish poet writing in Lithuanian language, really a, uh, an exception, uh, a, a very special exception of that uh, uh, time. She had first signs of recognition and uh, uh, her life ended up very, uh, her, life, her life tragically ended um, uh, very quickly. She was killed at the beginning of the Holocaust, uh, and her diary ends up on the eve of the Holocaust. But um, uh, the meaning of, uh, of the diary uh, 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 comes from, from this uh, uh, figure, from this figure it's itself, from her meaning in a larger cultural context. The same is with, with, uh, with Hitzhok Rudashevsky. He was one of the leaders of the uh, youth cultural life in the Vilna Ghetto. He organized youth events, he participated in them, he read his, uh, his text in the uh, Vilna Ghetto theater. And uh, uh, this makes uh, these diaries a par particularly iconic and very strong uh, uh, memory sites. Uh, and uh, uh, Zofia's uh, question about uh, uh, the previous perception and the perception of uh, uh, these diaries uh, in Lithuania. Now, uh, the story about uh, Itzhok Rudashevsky's diary is uh, kind of complicated because due to the factors that I've mentioned be be before, especially uh, due to the uh, fact of his uh, pro-Soviet uh, opinions, uh, this diary uh, used uh, uh, to be uh, um, uh, censored in a way. Uh, the same is uh, with uh, Anna Frank's uh, uh, diary, Anna Frank's history. Uh, Abraham, Abraham Sutskever, who uh, prepared the first publication of a diary omitted certain places, especially connected with his pro-Soviet views. And uh, this uh, was obviously uh, uh, a problem uh, for the first uh, uh, publisher. And uh, he tried to uh, escape uh, uh, these contradictions, uh, those problematic uh, aspects uh, of, of, of the diary. But in the present day, uh, Lithuania, uh, I was also expecting uh, a kind of uh, uh, debate about uh, these, uh, 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 these aspects of the text, uh, a kind of uh, conflict or contradictions. However, uh, to my um, astonishment, uh, this diary was um, received very well uh, and it had huge coverage in the Lithuanian media. It became a bestseller and uh, even some figures of uh, the Lithuanian church, some prominent uh, 
Catholic figures, uh, a, a well-known priests, uh, publicly declared that uh, the uh, contradictory uh, places in this uh, diary should be treated from a historical uh, perspective. Perspective that the memory of uh, 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 this uh, uh, child, of this boy, that uh, this diary should be should be perceived first of all as bearing an ethical message, uh, an, uh, an ethical and a moral mes message to, to us all. And it was really a very positive uh, surprise to me. Uh, uh, really, uh, this publication received a very uh, positive uh, uh, coverage. And I think it's a sign, it's a very hopeful sign of a changing uh, public discourse uh, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, the publication of Matilda Otkinaita's diary is uh, really fresh, it's, it's really uh, new. Uh, it appeared uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, this year. Uh, so the perception process is still uh, going on. But of course, in case of Olkinaita, she's felt as very close to Lithuanian mentality and very close to Lithuanian identity. Uh, the most prob problematic thing is, of course, uh, that uh, she was killed by the Lithuanian collaborators. Uh, but this fact, or I think, also serves for building a empathy and, and uh, uh, the uh, adequate uh, Holocaust memory, adequate recognition of the Holocaust events in uh, uh, Lithuania. And it also prompts huge empathy. Uh, empathy based uh, on the fact that this author, this poet was a true Lithuanian patriot. Uh, she uh, uh, she uh, uh, was absolutely solidar with the Lithuanians during the Soviet occupation. And I think this could also make a breakthrough in the public mentality, in the public thinking, a breakthrough breakthrough through that helps us understand the Holocaust authors as our own, our own history, our uh, own uh, children in some sense. Can I speak? So I, 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 I hope <laughs> I was able to, to answer your, your questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very, very. Sorry, I was I was sure if I'm already on vision. <laughs> thank you very much. I already have a, another round of question. One is actually what are you already what uh, the same with my that's by Sue Weiss also about the pr reception, but she especially asks about uh, the reception or how it the the, the 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 diaries or the diaries by Rudashevsky is included in school uh, and school programs and books and how it's being used. So maybe you can elaborate could elaborate a bit more on that. And uh, another question, <coughs> which is. Um, so I find quite interesting is by Roma Sendika. She will also be uh, speaking in the panel later. And she says, uh, according to Ruth estimations, 85% of the 6 million Jews um, murdered during the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. However, mm -hmm. Yiddish did not become the main source for terms and metaphors in Holocaust studies. Have you... Um, come across in your translator's practice, uh, can you come across terms and notions that would be useful in global Holocaust studies? Terms that would shed light on the specifically Eastern European experience of the Holocaust. And another question by uh, Gabor Dani, also one of the co-organizers on the conf of the conference is, uh, that you mentioned blanks uh, or blank spaces in, in, in the diaries. Um, uh, on semantic level, what kind of meanings do they involve? May we consider mm -hmm. blanks as man meaningful, integrated elements of these very special historical texts? And if yes, to what uh, extent? Um, I think this maybe is enough for now, then maybe I will mm -hmm. put my question later on if there is still time. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Now, uh, uh, the changes to school programs uh, 
um, including uh, uh, the both diaries and school pro programs were made uh, also very recently in 2017 and uh, during uh, the uh, uh, changes transformation of our uh, literary curriculum at Lithuanian gymnasiums um, the Ministry of Education built a certain canon of uh, Holocaust diaries by children uh, that are read by Lithuanian pupils and this canon um, consists of three texts and Anna Frank of course as a classical text then Itzhak Rudashevsky and Matilda Olkinait. So we, we now have this very special uh, Lithuanian and European uh, 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 mix, uh, a connection between three different texts uh, which are compared and discussed upon in the Lithuanian schools. And I also had several seminars with Lithuanian teachers about the possible uh, connections and possible interpretations of his uh, diaries. There are really many questions and, and uh, uh, many possible um, uh, comparisons, uh, uh, really different uh, experience, different con contexts. And I think uh, uh, that this uh, connection of these three diaries uh, proved really fruitful. Um, it uh, allows to uh, localize the Holocaust memory for young Lithuanian school children very clearly and to compare the uh, also the different gender perspectives uh, uh, while analyzing these uh, diaries because they are also uh, clearly noticeable uh, both in, in case of, uh, of Anna Frank of course and, and Rudashevsky and, uh, and Tolkienite uh, these, these gender perspectives also uh, are, are, are clear in, in the text in, in these texts so um, I think uh, this comparison and interpretation may be really uh, fruitful. And as I mentioned, this is uh, this is a start. This, these are very recent changes, and I am also wondering myself about uh, about the outcomes, about the results uh, for our uh, mentality of, of, of our new generations. I, I am I'm sure they be, uh, they will be uh, really uh, very profound and positive. Uh, now a question uh, about uh, uh, the Yiddish, uh, uh, Yiddish legacy and meaning of uh, Yiddish culture, uh, Yiddish heritage to the memory of uh, the Holocaust. Well, uh, I think that uh, in Lithuania, Yiddish uh, legacy and the Holocaust memory are really connected very much and maybe this is this is a difference uh, with uh, uh, other uh, European countries Central European countries countries more to the west uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, Vilnius was really a major center of Yiddish culture and uh, uh, really uh, Yiddish language uh, uh, was dominating uh, in the cultural life of uh, Lithuanian Jews, both in, in Vilnius, in Kaunas, and, and, and in other cities. And an interesting feature uh, is, which uh, you might have noticed if, if, you, if you visited uh, Vilnius or other cities, if you visited their former ghetto territories, uh, that uh, 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 almost all signs, uh, all major signs, signs at the uh, memory places, at the memorial sites of Jewish culture and the Holocaust, be our Yiddish inscriptions. Our whole city is full of Yiddish text on those uh, sites. And it uh, uh, 
they, they make uh, this territory a commemoration territory for Yiddish culture. Uh, and, and, and I think this is, this is very, uh, very, uh, very authentic and, and very true to the facts. Uh, some visitors from uh, contemporary uh, Israel uh, find it also uh, puzzling and they speak about, uh, sometimes they speak about uh, the lack of Hebrew inscriptions. And they also recognize that is a partic uh, particular feature of our uh, memory culture, that it's so much connected uh, to uh, Yiddish language and still keeps the, the memory of this language and its, its life in our public, uh, public space. Uh, and um, uh, I, my, my work is also connected to, uh, to Yiddish literature very, uh, very much. Uh, I think that uh, through uh, these efforts, through bringing back Yiddish texts from oblivion, from oblivion and by showing uh, their authentic, uh, authentic uh, form, their authentic text, which is in Yiddish, of course. Uh, we, are, uh, we are doing uh, 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 our, we are pe pe performing uh, our duty to the culture which was largely annihilated during the Holocaust because the main Yiddish audience, uh, the main audience of Yiddish literature and culture perished uh, in those times. And, and uh, this, is, this is our duty. Uh, for uh, for this culture, for for this people, uh, and uh, now uh, the question about the uh, the blinds, about these uh, empty spaces. Uh, of course, uh, in 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 all manuscripts, and especially in the manuscripts from the uh, from the Holocaust times, there are many. Illegible, illegible places or, or, or omissions, places which are uh, hard to interpret, or inscriptions on the margins, which either have to be incorporated into the text, incorporated into the narrative, or left, uh, or left outside, or left uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the notes. And uh, each time it's, of course, a question to uh, interpretation. Uh, but uh, indicating these uh, these omissions, these blinds uh, is also uh, has also to be uh, to be done, uh, and uh, uh, this is true both uh, uh, in speaking about Dashevsky's and Olkinaita's diary. Uh, so uh, these uh, spaces are simply indicated uh, as omissions. Uh, uh, interpreting these uh, these omissions or these illegible uh, places uh, may be may may be left to must be left to to the reader himself. Uh, but in some in some uh, in some cases, uh, when text appears on the margins or we can connect uh, it with the main main event may main narrative of, of that text, or, or we, we may establish uh, the facts that um, are uh, omitted in, in the text and tell them in the introductory articles. Uh, this, uh, this can also be done, and this also must be done uh, to uh, um, make this text uh, as full of a possible meanings as, uh, as, as we can do our best. But of course, the translator and the editor must uh, uh, leave these uh, spaces for, for the reader's interpretation, for the reception. Uh, and uh, every time it's a very subtle thing to do. It's a subtle interpretation that is needed and uh, the toxicological command. Uh, which helps us in such cases. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much. I, um, I think we are almost running out of time, but so maybe I will 
withdraw my next question. Uh, maybe there will be other occasions to discuss those, but I just wanted to maybe once more ask again the question by Roma Sendika, because I think you answered it partially, but she also asked in a way if you found during working on the translations some sort of notions, terms, uh, s which are specifically sort of used in the um, understand in the in Yiddish during the Holocaust, which could enter the sort of general Holocaust discourse. I guess in Polish, for example, it would be the word. I this is my idea, Schmalzownice, which is sort of specifically describing the situation. So I, I understood this was also Roma's questions. If a question, if you came over such specific notions, terms which would enter the broader Holocaust discourse, thanks to your translations. Uh, thank you. I must think about that. I must, must really think about, uh, about that. Um, I have no, no, no answer uh, yet, but uh, this is a great idea to use uh, met metaphors uh, from these texts um, uh, in, in Yiddish, in Yiddish language uh, uh, itself. Uh, Yes, let me think about those met metaphors in the future. I, I, I hope we will have more discussions and collaborating with the European Network of Remembrance and so that and uh, return to this topic again. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to finish because I think we have to still leave like 15 minutes uh, uh, to everybody to, to make a small break. Uh, before we enter into the next uh, discussion round. But thank you very much, and I hope there will be other uh, occasions to discuss further on the issues which you touched upon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You so much. And uh, we will uh, meet in uh, 15 uh, minutes, I guess, so at uh, uh, 4.30, 4, yes, 4.30 4, uh, 4 uh, Central European uh, time. See you later then.
Uh, hello. Uh, um, nice to be back. It's, you talked just about alienation, so I must also feel alienated because I heard your conversation but couldn't join. <laughs> I speak to the panelists. But welcome again. Uh, uh, on, the, on, on the panel overlooking the local dimensions of the Holocaust language and the cultural spatial politics uh, of uh, transmission. And in the second uh, uh, part of, of, of this um, panel, we will have four, uh, four speeches, uh, four presentations um, uh, by uh, six speakers. And, and then uh, we will uh, go into discussion afterwards. So uh, the first speaker will be uh, Dorota Głowacka. She is director of the Contemporary Studies Program and professor of humanities at the University of King's College in the US. And she has received her PhD in comparative literature from the State University of New York uh, at Buff Buffalo. And she has taught critical theory, Holocaust and genocide studies, as well as th theories of gender and race at uh, the Contemporary Studies program already since 1995, and has also lectures in the Foundation uh, Year program and Dalhousie uh, University, where she has been cross-appointed to the graduate faculties of English, gender, and women's studies and European studies uh, and interdisciplinary studies as well. And uh, she will be talking about uh, mistranslations uh, in, uh, sh in one of the outtakes or in the outtakes from Shoah's, uh, Claude Shoah's, uh, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah. Uh, uh, Professor Gowaska, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Zofia. I'm actually in Canada. And I will begin by saying that I'm speaking to you today from my home in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. However, for more than 10,000 years, this place has been known to the Mi'kmaq people here as Chibuktuk. And it is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq. And I'm saying this not only because uh, territorial acknowledgement is now customary in Canada, but also because I want to convey that the locations from which we speak matter, that our voices and languages in which we speak are not only embodied, but also what I call emplaced. And as such, they bear witness to these sites and to the histories of these locations and sometimes even against our explicit intentions. Um, at the center of my engagement with Lanzmann Shoah are Polish sequences in both his eponymic Holocaust film and in the outtakes, and I focus on what I perceive, <coughs> excuse me, to be the director's effort to control and suppress testimony by Polish witnesses, and on his contempt for the Polish witnesses' native tongue, and in contrast to languages he holds in high esteem, such as Hebrew, English, German, and of course his native French. And if Lanzmann sets for himself the task of telling the story of the extermination of European Jews, a part of the task is to unmask Polish prejudices and hostility toward the Jewish neighbors. Um, I argue, however, that Lanzmann's prime strategy is a linguistic one aimed at the Polish language as the carrier of Polish national values and attitudes. And these values and attitudes comprise thick layers of anti-Semitic prejudice and Judeophobia. Indeed, protracted translation sequences in Lanzmann show I reveal the extent to which language as such is implicated in symbolic violence. Uh, and in Poland, negative stereotypes about Jews have been woven into the very fabric of the Polish language in the form of linguistic fossils and dead metaphors whose for forgotten roots reach deep into the past. Uh, such linguistic acts of negative valuation of the Jewish other occur naturally in everyday speech and are not registered by language users, since they originate in sources that may not be consciously grasped and acknowledged. Um, Lanzmann's disregard for the Polish language, however, is peculiar. It manifests in the way Polish place names are skewered by horrible misspellings, um, also of Polish witnesses' names. Uh, for, for place names, that includes Sobibur, Helmno, Łódź, and Oświęcim, the main places. And infracting fundamental rules of Polish orthography, these uh, flagrant distortions of Polish proper names appear to a Polish eye as a weapon of linguistic uh, revenge. And to me, as a native speaker of Polish, 
they literally hurt, uh, which is testimony to affective investments we carry with respect to languages we speak. And in the case of play na place names, Lanzmann's mutilations of Polish words seem to be wrought on locations that in the past bore silent, indifferent witness to the suffering of the Jews. So it seems that throughout the Polish sequences, Polish language itself, indelibly marked by the trauma of the extermination of Polish Jews, is put on trial before the camera. And uh, as Polish scholars Joanna Tokarska-Bakir and Grzegorz Niziołek have noted, the gaze the director casts upon Poland is redolent of a colonial mindset, which allows him to present Polish witnesses as backwards exotic others who inhabit an empty, unchanging and pre-modern landscape. And let me add that the contempt for subaltern languages and attempts to replace them with a more civilized tongue has always been um, a part of a colonial mindset. And the most poignant example in the settler colonial country of Canada was the near destruction or linguicide of indigenous languages through aggressive assimilation, including Indian residential schools, which was used as a tactic of colonial conquest. So in light uh, of Lanzmann's disparaging attitude toward the Polish language and his silencing of the testimony in Polish, I'd like to draw attention to what transcends the words that have been translated in the official version of the film and thus heard by the viewers and interpreters. And specifically what I hear in the apertures of the film's translatory exchanges when I listen to them with my kind of doubly hyphenated Polish Jewish Canadian ear are evanescent yet poignant moments of dialogic exchange and rapprochement between Polish and Jewish witnesses. They are only liminally registered by Lanzmann's camera and microphone, both of which accidentally capture the affective charge of the witness's speech. Uh, they escape the director's control, but also the witness's own attention and linguistic competence. And I refer to these moments as events of co-witnessing. And here I will uh, focus on one example of such intertwining of the witness's voices, which I came across in one of the outtakes from the film. So here it goes uh, in one long sequence. I don't know if I get the image here or not. And if not, I just try to describe it. Perfect magic uh, in one. Thank you so much. In one long sequence shot at the site of the former Helmno camp, we see Shimon Srebnik, a survivor of the second period of the Helmno extermination camp. Uh, Srebnik was deported to Helmno from the Łódź ghetto in March 1944. And to the viewers of Shoah, he is best known as the boy singer who appears in the infamous episode in front of the church in Helmno, surrounded by what has been described as an anti-Semitic crowd of Polish villagers. The sequence in question, however, which did not make it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> into the final cut, takes place at the site of the camp. And Srebnik is standing where he says uh, the sleeping quarters used to be now and now is perhaps a sawmill. So he's surrounded by Polish workers, one of whom is particularly interested in Srebnik's recollection because at the time he was a forced laborer and he often worked alongside Jewish prisoners. Uh, Srebnik and the man begin to reminisce together. The man is helping Srebnik find the right words in Polish while Srebnik has a better recall of what actually happened and he corrects the man's version of events to which his interlocutor responds, Tak, pan ma rację, słusznie pan mówi. Yes, you are right, you are saying it right. After a while, they begin to finish each other's sentences, and as the memories converge, they turn to face each other and repeatedly nod the heads. Uh, one of the episodes that they both witnessed and are now trying to recreate is the accident when one of the gassing vans transporting Jewish inmates from the castle, in which um, um, uh, they had been held, slid on the snow and hit the ditch, spilling the people who were suffocating to death inside this makeshift gas chamber onto the road. And the two men saw the accident from very different vantage points. The Polish worker was watching from a distance. The Germans chased Polish onlookers away to a nearby forest, while Srebnik was brought in from the camp with a work detail to clean up and load the bodies back into the van. Uh, it's, a, it's a long sequence and eventually to Lanzmann's question where, whether there was only one driver of the van, they, they replied together at the same time, Jeden Bill, and they nod the heads. 
and uh, I, I wish I could show you the whole sequence. It's about like, you know, goes over an hour, an hour and a half. And it, it is incredible because just in the previous outtake, the same man was challenging Srebnik about why the Jews were so cowardly and didn't try to escape. So like the usual stock, the anti-Semitic canard that we often hear in the Polish sequences. And then as they begin to reminisce together, this dynamic changes so radically. Uh, so the outtakes at the site of the former camp in Helmno, in which Srebnik speaks in fluent Polish, attest to his agency courage and capacity to bear witness. And they contrast with the episode included in the film in which he appears to be standing passively and silently in front of the church. Although the outtake shows Srebnik speaking Polish animatedly and at length, only the survivor's silence in Polish amid that anti-Semitic cackle in front of the church is foregrounded in the film. Uh, in fact, even in that scene, Srebnik is hardly silent since uh, he's exchanging comments with those around him, but his words are for the most part inaudible and remain untranslated. I wonder if perhaps the tech, fantastic, thank you. So what also drew my attention in the same sequence with the Polish workers are Srebnik's questions about raspberry bushes. Uh, he interrupts his interlocutor, the man in the green uh, beret, who is another former worker, to ask all of a sudden whether raspberry bushes are still growing nearby. And as you can see, he gestures in that direction, he says, Tutaj były maliny, gdzie maliny są? Tu maliny, tu były. And he goes on like that. The raspberries were here. Where are the raspberries? Here, raspberries, they were here. And he keeps returning to the question about maliny, uh, including in his conversation in German with Landsmann in another outtake taken on that site. He doesn't know the German word, so he says it in Polish while he's talking to Landsmann in German. Srebrenik's ungrammatical, though fluent Polish, betrays his estrangement from the community of the Polish language, but it also conveys his attachment to the place gdzie rosły maliny, where the raspberry bushes used to grow. Excuse me. And it is the raspberries that truly linger in Srebrenik's memory. And uh, for those of you who remember the film well, I'm alluding here to the song that opens the film <clears throat> in which Srebrenik is rowing on the river and singing the same song he used to sing when he was in German captivity, which I can't quite sing right now. It's like, Mały Biały Domek May Pamięci Tkwi, you may remember. A little white house lingers in my memory, but it is again, the memory, the, the raspberry bushes that, that truly uh, stuck in his memory. Srebnik's return to Helmno is first and foremost a return to his native tongue, whose taste he remembers literally on his tongue through the recollection of Maline, and it is that gustatory sensation as if of tasting the Polish word Maline that triggers the recollection of the past, and likely the relation between Srebnik's return to Poland and the word connoting nourishment is not coincidental. Both in the film and in the outtakes, he recalls the unbearable hunger that he experienced in the Łódź ghetto. He says that hunger made him indifferent to death and stunted his ability to experience grief for the dead and dying relatives. And in comparison with hunger, everything else was, he says, ganz egal. And that's a German expression, but it's been incorporated into colloquial Polish. Uh, during the sequence with the Polish workers, while Srebnik answers Lanzmann's questions about what happened in Helmno, he keeps circling back to the memory of hunger. And when asked if he was thinking about his mother who had been murdered in Helmno, he gives what sounds like a callous answer. Kto myślał o matce? Każdy myślał zjeść coś, kawałeczek chleba. Who thought about the mother if everyone only thought to eat something, a little piece of bread. Uh, so is there a connection perhaps between Srebnik's mother tongue, the language of hunger that he spoke in Łódź, and his sudden then in that outtake recollection of his mother's purse, containing documents and family photographs, which Srebnik found in a pile of victims' effects that he was forced to sort out as a part of his duties in the camp's house commando. In my view, it is not coincidental that this memory imposes itself to, together with the recollection of Maline, though he says he felt nothing about his mother's death. Uh, we can think of this substitution like psychoanalytically in terms of screen memory or perhaps traumatic traces 
of the past in witnesses speech a kind of decathexis and transference of intense affect onto another mnemonic object. Lanzmann, however, has no interest in Srebnik's recollections from the ghetto. He only wants to hear about his experiences in the camp. If we listen to what Srebnik is saying about his life in Łódź, however, we realize that most likely Polish was not the only mother tongue for Srebnik. Yiddish was also spoken in the Łódź ghetto. Lanzmann, however, feels no connection to the vanished world of Eastern European Yiddishkeit. And in fact, Lanzmann uh, refused Srebnik's request that they go to Łódź so he could visit the daughter of a man who sheltered him uh, after he had escaped from the camp. But even if Lanzmann doesn't hear it, Yiddish, the language of the majority of uh, the Ashkenazi Jews, keep cropping up in this film, an echo of the language of the majority of the Jewish victims. In the Polish sequences, several Polish witnesses recall the sounds of Jewish, though most of these resurfacings of Yiddish in their accounts is pejorative. Uh, Czesław Borowy, for instance, in his off-putting responses to Lanzmann's questions about what he saw in the Treblinka camp that was located adjacent to his farm, mimics the sounds of Yiddish, ra ra ra, and ai vey ai vey, and the sounds of fiddles and the honking of the geese. But a man in Grabów, uh, who is sitting on the doorstep of a formerly Jewish house, claims that he was fluent in Yiddish when he was a child, since most of his friends were Jewish. And on Lanzmann's request, he says a few words in Yiddish and then wipes his eyes. Uh, he also keeps repeating, ja byłem obecny przy tym, wszystko widziałem, tak ja tam byłem. I was present at that, I saw everything, yes, I was there. That is, uh, the man is seeing what happened to his neighbors through the sound of the Yiddish words that he's pronouncing, which is another instance of a peculiar syncretism of language and sense impressions in these testimonial event in the film. I, I really don't know how else I can describe this dynamic. Uh, Lanzmann discredits the man's knowledge of Yiddish and does the authenticity of his testimony because the man doesn't know the word shtetl. Uh, a similar, and uh, let me just quickly say that a li similar linguistic quid pro quo occurs when Lanzmann asks Polish inhabitants of Grabów uh, whether, where the synagogue was located. They don't know the word synagoga, so the translator Barbara Janicka explains that the word meant Żydowski Kościół, but the very same interlocutors later refer to Buznica, which is a common Polish word for the Jewish place of worship. Um, so it's just, you know, this kind of series of mistranslations of the word. And the director Lanzmann acts as if he had exposed the village's ignorance of Jewish customs, while Janicka is trying to navigate this contested linguistic terrain. Although such testimonial moments remain and are often smothered by the French trans translation, I do not view the translator's role as falsifying co-witnessing, but on the contrary, as potentially being its catalyst. Uh, hence, precisely, that's the somewhat pretentious title of my uh, title, the felicitous duplicity of mistranslation, by which I mean not only what is found rather than lost in translation, but also what can be found in mistranslation. And I argue for a kind of translations Felix culpa, happy failure, because it is in the tensions, misunderstandings, in the clashes between different linguistic universes of the film, that the unheard, the untranslated, or that which is spoken otherwise that in language conventionally understood, can be discerned, borne witness to, and perhaps brought into remembrance. Excuse me. And going back to Yiddish, the traces of that language which before the war was woven into the fabric of colloquial Polish also crop up in witnesses' speech. Mr. Gavkowski, for instance, the driver of the locomotive that was pulling the train with the transports to Treblinka, when describing them, his memories of Treblinka, uses the word stink. Um, bad smell to describe the terrible this terrible smell of decomposing bodies so in diametrically opposed ways the sounds of polish for srebrnik maliny and the sounds of yiddish ra 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 or stink for polish witnesses function as acoustic traces of the past the traces that are released in these often untranslated sequences as we have seen in frequent references to smell and food these words and sounds also carry olfactory and even taste sense memories. 
and by no means do these moments of closeness counter the poison of Christian anti-Semitism that permeates the words of Polish witnesses, but they do bespeak a need by at least some of them to affirm their own existence as Polish Christians by bearing witness to what happened to the Jews. In contrast to Lanzmann's coding of the locations of his Polish interviews as a ghastly landscape of death bereft of living memory, the exchanges between the witnesses at this particular site, the former location of the infrastructure of the home no extermination camp, allow us to glimpse a dynamic, and I would say nourishing, relation between the language uh, used by the witnesses, including nonverbal clues, and the site in which the conversation takes place, uh, through which the two temporalities, the past and the present, are chiasmatically looped. Shot through with the memories of trauma, the location in which the act of co-witnessing takes place is thus inseparable from the twisted and intertwined roots of the two witnesses' mother tongues. Mother tongue, uh, drawing attention to corporeal and affective registers of the witnesses' speech, I underscore the productive tension between the spatial linguistic proximity between the two witnesses and the untraversable, yet in this episode gradually shrinking, distance between the respective memories of the past. And uh, some uh, several conclusions, if I may, a very brief explanation of this paper's theoretical framework. Um, when I initially came up with the concept of co-witnessing, it was by putting in conversation Emmanuel Levinas's ethics of unconditional listening. Um, Emmanuel Levinas um, from Kaunas, Lithuania, I was thinking about that during the previous talk. Um, Levinas's um, ethics of turning an ear toward the other and uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's concept of being singular plural, that is the notion that we always compare or co-appear in the world with others. Uh, I, I'm not going to explain it, but I will add that the way I think of co-witnessing today as inseparable from the places which we traverse with our words and our bodies has been influenced by a partnerships I have developed with indigenous scholars, uh, specifically on a project on the intersections of the memory of the Holocaust and of settler colonial genocide. And indigenous worldviews allow me to conceive of co-witnessing as multiply relational, including all forms of beings like the earth, animals, plants, such as raspberry bushes, as co-witnesses imbued with personhood and agency. And in the language of the Mi'kmaq, for instance, this is affirmed in perhaps the most important phrase of that language, msitnokama, which means all my relations. And um, let me just conclude that the potential for Polish witnessing to the suffering of the Jews, both during and after the war was undermined in multiple ways, first by Germany's brutal occupation of Poland, which saw, Hitler saw as the wide East to be stripped of existing culture and history and resettled with non-Poles. Secondly, it was mutilated by Polish anti-Semitism woven into the nationalist ethos of Polish heroic struggle against the oppressor. For decades after the war, it was smothered by the official communist narrative of World War II, in which the extermination of Polish Jews was assimilated into the narrative of Polish victimhood. But that witness did happen, um, even if often in a kind of negative way, and it must be drawn out of the black hole of Lanzmann's mistranslations. And in my view, such recovery could allow us to restructure the testimonial force field in the film and open up a space for Polish and Jewish co-witnessing, uh, the phenomenon that both the director and many of the film's commentators have foreclosed. On the margins of Lanzmann's elaborately crafted narrative in the film and in the numerous instances in the outtakes, his camera and microphone recorded the plurality of languages and voices that used to coexist in Poland. Important encounters often face-to-face -face occur in the film between at least one of the survivors and Polish witnesses, also between Polish witnesses themselves, within, outside, and in between the official frames of the film encounters which Lanzmann himself, to his credit, made possible. Among the Babelian scattering of languages in this film, these fleeting exchanges between the witnesses in Polish escaped the mastery of French, English, and German as the languages in which to tell the history of the Shoah in Poland. 
And uh, I've, I worked on this subject and I've written this paper because I hope that recovering the moments of Polish Jewish co-witnessing, especially in those sites, can contribute to healing the festering wound of anti-Semitic stereotypes that still mark my native tongue. And it is uh, even more urgent now in today's deeply divided Poland in which Jews have always been and still are the paramount symbol of otherness. Uh, this is why it is important that we still listen to the voices recorded by Lanzmann with a different ear, the ear that is attuned to what is silent, untranslated, and yet deeply emplaced in the sites of trauma. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very, very interesting presentation, which already now opens quite some questions. But before we enter the discussion, we will gather all the presentations, which I think fit all very well together, because the next presentation by uh, Roma Sendika and um, uh, and Magda Hadel will, in a way, take on uh, what you were talking about to a sort of next uh, step, because they will be talking about regaining the voices of bystanders in Landsman mm. uh, Shoah, or they will try to regain them. Uh, um, and uh, I will now introduce our presenters. Uh, Roma Sendika is as uh, Associate Professor at the Jagiellonian University, and uh, founding the director of the Research Center for Memory Cultures um, at, the, the, at the same university. She, is also teacher, she also teaches uh, at the Anthropology of Literature and Cultural Studies Department uh, at the Faculty of Polish Studies in Krakow. And she is co-founder of a curatorial collective and specializes in criticism and theory, visual culture studies, and uh, memory studies, and focuses on relations between images, sites, and memory, and is currently working on a project on non-sites of memory in Central and Eastern Europe, and bystanders uh, testimonies her uh, one of her most recent publications, published just this year, is Beyond Camps, Non-Sites of Memory. And Magda Heidel uh, is also associate professor at the Jagiellonian University, uh, where she heads the Center for Translation Studies and an MA program in literary translations. And she's um, the editor of, uh, in chief of a journal of literary translations uh, titled Przekładaniec and the author of two monographs on uh, T.S. Eliot in Polish literature and uh, uh, another <coughs> title, Translation, Zeal, Poetic Translation in the Work of Czesław Miłosz. And she's also co-editor uh, of an uh, Anthologies of Translation Studies and has recently published an edited volume titled Polish Translation Studies in Action. Um, and her, she herself is also not re only a researcher, but also translator into Polish. And her authors include Virginia Woolf, Joseph Conrad, and many other quite famous uh, authors. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, yes, and now uh, please, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, let me start with saying that Roma and myself are really very, very glad to be uh, here and talk um, after Dorota's interesting and, and engaging presentation, which uh, somehow sets floor for our research, which is more concerned on, on particular elements of the testimonies presented in Shoah. Uh, but I also wanted to say that Mindauda's Kwitaukas uh, um, uh, speech opened up a lot of interesting vistas for us. Um, let me just mention the the, uh, the problem of the children's voice or the specific quality of, of the voice in memoirs, also the literary quality of the testimonies. And I think we'll be able to catch up on these um, uh, threads uh, while we present our uh, project. Um, this paper is based on the results of an experimental project which was undertaken by an interdisciplinary working group at the Jagiellonian and we aimed at regaining the voices of Polish witnesses or bystanders interviewed by Claude Lanzmann in his documentary. Um, we are 
going to present just a tiny section of the work and this is the the scene in with Shimon Srebrnik and the villagers in front of the parish church in Helmno which uh, was already mentioned by uh, by other speakers um what it made us aware of the the project the attempt uh, is the enormous role language plays in testimony and memory transfer and hence how vital it is to include translation studies perspective into understanding it shoa is uh, of course a multilingual material uh, but we have also seen how impactful the place and context of the act of testimony is, how it depends on the kind of in a kind of organic way on various aspects of the local. Um, our project um, focuses on Polish bystanders whose testimonies and whose language have for a long time not been given enough attention, uh, we are sure. Um, the concept for the project is very straightforward and uh, it consisted in transcribing the actual utterances of Lanzmann's Polish interviewees and then translating them into English with a maximal accuracy and closeness to the original in mind. Uh, you can imagine that as soon as we started, uh, there appeared huge areas of difficulty, both on translation and memory studies plane. And it opened up uh, uh, an array of further research perspectives. Uh, part of these troubles and difficulties stemmed from the fact that we were not working with a manuscript, but we were working with a, um, with a recording, which was also full of lacunae or um, vague places. Uh, so this was also like a recovery of a kind of original that was not perfect, not ready for us. It was not like translating Virginia Woolf in a, in a um, uh, perfectly edited Oxford version. Uh, so first of all, it turned out that it is extremely difficult to hear and understand all that is being said in the film, especially in group scenes like the one we were working at, um, where people speak simultaneously or outshout each other or exchange private remarks on site. Uh, also, it was far from obvious, obvious how to organize the transcript uh, in writing to give justice to the simultaneity and polyphony of voices merged with the question and answer pattern of the interview and doubled with the interpreting. Um, another problem stemmed from the non-standard language the interviewees use. Uh, local accents, linguistic variants, uh, both on the level of um, vocabulary and structure. And yet another level of difficulty was connected with the local context referred to, which was obvious to the village inhabitants, to the speakers, but it was unclear to us in many cases. Also, the village's collective memory, which enabled them to invoke images, was clear to them, even if, con in, if, if it was conflicting at times, but it was very often inaccessible to us as the research team. Um, so the main reason we started um, the project uh, is the well-known fact that the subtitles in Shoa cover only a section of the original testimony given in Polish. Uh, Polish, as well as Hebrew and Yiddish, are given the status of foreign tongues, as opposed to French, German and English, which are spoken by the director. Um, there are even technical Dif differences in, in managing these languages um, on the screen. Uh, the subtitles result from a double translation. So there is the interpreter from Polish into French. She produces her French version and then the French version is turned into English subtitles. What the interpreter does uh, sorry, what the interpreter uh, what the interpreter does not render on site never finds its way to the English version. And obviously the work condition for the interpreter were very, very hard and, and it's, a, it's a separate topic in itself. The losses are both quantitative and qualitative. Some parts of the testimonies are excluded and what is left lacks the specific, specific character of the bystanders' enunciations. Uh, first of all, uh, spontaneity and freedom of, of enunciation, then markers of the specific geographic location of the events, then um, uh, what is uh, missing is the characteristic quality of the slightly artificial school learned Polish. They clearly consider more appropriate for the occasion of conversing with a guest, with a foreign guest. So they are trying to use a, a language that is more sophisticated they, they, that the, than their everyday speech and hence is supposed to correspond to the solemnity and importance of the of the testimony. 
also um, what is missed is signals of negotiating the speakers uh, by the speakers the position and hierarchy within the group and also perhaps most importantly um, the traces of war trauma and the memory construction process involved um, in short the message is simplified clarified rationalized so uh, to anybody who uh, uh, reads translation um, studies, it is simply manipulated in a very harsh uh, way. Um, uh, Gary Weissman, who studies the Hebrew testimonies in Shoah, writes about the inevitable mistranslations found, uh, which found their way into Lanzmann's film. And we may add, with surprising positive critical, critical response, becoming the foundation for canonized and much cited book version of the film transcript. Contemporary translation studies lets us understand that various factors influencing the act of interlingual translation are always at work, especially those um, uh, connected with power relation framework. Um, and there is definitely, we think, an urgent need to amend, amend the translation by coming back to the Polish original and producing a version based on a different principle. Uh, this is obvious also in the light of the emerging bystander stud studies, stressing the fact that the testimonies, the testimonies of the bystanders need to be given a lot more careful attention. Roma. Thank you, Magda. So Magda uh, told you how our specific project started. It was uh, after our uh, endeavor that we uh, took uh, up as a, as, a, as a specific task uh, and, and, and developed together with uh, interesting scholars from our department as well as experts and, and PhD scholars that uh, should be probably already mentioned. So Karolina Kwaśna, Joanna Sobest and Sylvia Papier. And uh, so, so the gist of our argument is, uh, was that in the case of this, this particular material, which deals with traumatic memory, carries a huge psychological load. So these changes not only distort the message on the linguistic plane and, and of course misco misconstrues the meaning of, of phrases, but also prove to be detrimental to understanding of the testimony given and the positions taken by the bystanders. So hence it leads to dismissing or manipulating the context of the communication within the film and the processes of memory production involved. So ignoring the, the local result, the, ignoring the local results in serious impoverishing of the film importance as the historical source. So we claim after, after this experiment we carried out, it is also strongly, it also strongly influences the directions of possible interpretations. And one of those important seminal interpretations is Shoshana Feldman in the, uh, in an era of testimony Claude Lanzmann's show, which is kind of a, conversant uh, article for us in this in this speech. Uh, she discusses the difficulty that Barbara Janicka experiences while translating the accounts of uh, Helmians gathered around Szymon Srebrnik in front of the village church. Uh, Feldman does not interpret the broken, imperfect accounts of the Polish bystanders as resulting for either the impact of wartime experience or violen of violence or post-war experience of living in a totalitarian state and being subject of, to constant invigilation. And she says, facing Lanzmann, the Polish villagers in turn exhibit feelings that would normally be hidden, but the silent interviewer and the silent camera urge us not simply to see the testimony, but to see through it, to see throughout the testimony, the deception and the self-deception, which, which it unwittingly displays and to which it unintentionally testifies, unquote. So our intention, conversely, has been to make others see the testimony, not to see through it. We have been interested in the surface of the language production, which was by no means transparent. It was the opacity of the speech together with its possible reasons and effects that was at the center of our investigation. The interviewer may be silent, but the interviewees talk and they talk a lot. There is abundance of speech rather than the sil that silence. We focused our attention on what and how is being said. Concluding her interpretation of the scene in front of the church, Feldman claims that Polish bystanders, quote, 
bear false witness both to the history of Nazism and to the history of the Jews. By dreaming their memory, failing to imagine the experience of the Jews, projecting their own fantasies and mystifications outside as historical reality. Leaving the details of our findings aside, we would like to claim that the communicative situation in the scene is more complex. Uh, and in what follows, uh, we concentrate on two minute elements of the conversation in front of the church to point towards missing, distorted, ignored parts of the communication uh, and the pertinence to, for fuller understanding of the testimony given. So in the opening parts of uh, Victims, Perpetrators and Bystanders About Seeing, this is the second chapter of the Feldman text, she claims the Poles, unlike the Jews, do see, but as bystanders, they do not quite look and uh, they avoid looking directly and thus they overlook at once their responsibility and their complicity as witnesses. Her claim is based on the following exchange uh, from the Helmno church scene. Could you look? Uh, you couldn't look there. You couldn't talk to a Jew. You, even going by the road, on, uh, you couldn't look there. Did they look anyway? Yes, vans came and the Jews were moved up further off. You could see them, but on the slide, in the slide, long glances. That much is included in the subtitles. Why, actually, there is much more said and explained. The whole exchange takes less than one minute, yet the response is very rich and comes from many participants. The utterance that never get represented in French uh, or English are marked in red. This is the column number three. Uh, and this, uh, so this is the Polish part. And in, this comes in our translation in column number five. And then Magda will perhaps explain in more details uh, how this, this, this grid is organized. But this uh, um, picture is just to give you an idea of the amount that is missed or excluded. Uh, so column three tells you what is actually said in Polish. Column five is the uh, the um, equivalent in English. Uh, so you have the original uh, on the left and the translated material on the right. First in column four, uh, the subtitles and then the full translation. Uh, we are going to show you uh, um, the close ups to uh, parts of this. Uh, table. So don't worry about reading it now um, in a detailed way. So uh, All as right, you Roma, see, red, so is can... yeah. red, is, red comes mm -hmm. quite often in this, in this grid. So coming back to the example, the, the sheer fact that so much from what the people of Helmno uh, say has been missed or ignored makes Feldman interpretation and her conclusions dubious. The issue of seeing, looking, grows out of Latzman question, uh, did they have any food? Janicka's Polish version, czy tutaj dostarczano im coś do jedzenia, czy nie, was there any food delivered to them or not, modulates the director's simple question and includes a strong suggestion that someone was supposed to deliver food to the prisoners in the church. Hence the Helmians break into explanations that it was impossible, no way, no as even a looking at the church was forbidden and could result in some form of physical punishment, which is not named. It was not allowed to even look at it, to take a look. When you walked along the road, it was enough to take a look and right then you got, and this suggests to a Polish speaker, got hit or got killed. The tone of the, the utterance clearly indicates that uh, they see the question as naive and stemming from complete lack of understanding of the war reality. Hence, the following remarks on uh, taking sidelong glances and looking discreetly. They admit to looking and seeing in spite of the danger. The broken phrase, you were always only supposed to look somewhere else. So he wouldn't say, yeah, seems to recall a personal memory of a particular situation, a particular he, perhaps a particular guard. It clearly refers to individual fears if, uh, as if, uh, he says, I look there, he, I, were, I will be, be beaten or killed, and recalls private defense strategies. I must look somewhere else. Magda. Mm -hmm. um, well, in the context of the Helmno church scene, Feldman asks, why does memory ring linger? The inquirer would like to know. What motivates this livelihood of remembrance? This is Feldman's words. She provides no definite answer. Um, and uh, instead, she quotes a narrative passage given by a woman standing in the group surrounding Srebnik in front of the church. 
Um, why does the whole village remember him? They remember him well because he walked with chains on his ankles and he sang on the river. He was young, he was skinny, he looked ready for his coffin. Even the Polish, this is Feldman's edition, lady, uh, when she saw that child, she told the German, let that child go. Uh, he asked her where to, to his father and mother. Looking at the sky, the German, this is again Feldman said, he'll soon go to them. Uh, here, I'm, I'm operating the remote also, which is, all right. Here is our transcript translation of this exchange. The missed material is marked red again. The yellow highlights um, mark uh, an addition from the interpreter. Srebrnik's famous singing on the river is actually not mentioned by the Helmians here. Uh, what is obviously absent from this textual representation, on the other hand, is its theatricality, rich gesticulation and body language, helping to vividly uh, reenact the scene. Um, um, you can see the, um, the, the speaker of this uh, short narration that we're going to, to see in a minute, uh, look up into the sky and speaks to the German at the same time, remembering speaking to the German. Uh, back to, to, to the previous image. Uh, first of all, um, what answers Feldman's question why memory lingers is a rich array of details, the Helmian recalls. What the boy looked like, the way his chains were arranged, uh, what he did, whom he accompanied. Uh, um, this is all missing from the subtitles and the English version. Um, so the Helmians definitely were not just uh, looking sidelong and discreetly, but they were giving the scene very attentive uh, glances. Um, what should be also noted is the fact that Lanzmann in, in Lanzmann's interlocutors seem to be more or less the same age as Srebnik is. So when they verbalize their memories, they return to the impressions left on the young psyches, hence perhaps the vividness of the details and the emotionality of narration. Interestingly, in, the case, in this case, it is the interpreter who cuts the explanation short by including the phrase he sang on the river in place of all the details that were given. Still, Lanzmann's next question, il avait l'air gay ou triste, opens up a space for more detailed and emotional responses, including a particular inter particularly interesting longer narration by one of the women. And here we have um, the Polish original, our full translation and the subtitles. All, is, all that is in red is not included in the summarizing translation that is um, there in the, in the English version. This passage is in fact a dramatic scene unfolding before the listener's eye. Um, the woman plays both parts, presenting, this is spoken by the, the woman in red scarf, um, presenting a dialogue with lines introduced in a very simple, repetitive way. I say, and he says, and I say, and he says. Uh, she gives her account of the particular lines, the way they, were, they have lingered in her memory no matter if they were fully realistic, imagined or repeated after somebody else. Uh, on a more general level, it also helps to understand the structure of community and communication in the occupied Helmno. A Polish woman or girl living in the occupied village was talking to a German soldier about a young Jew who does not even have the status of a human being. Yet it is precisely the boy's humanity that is the subject of the exchange. Uh, they were most probably talking in German. Uh, and so trans she's actually translating the scene into Polish, back into, well, not really back into Polish. She's translating the scene into Polish for Lanzmann. Um, of course, the, 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 um, the remark that is uh, uh, at the end of the passage, uh, Srebrnik's remark, must have been uh, 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 added in Polish, so the language excluding the Germans. Um, only a section of the woman's story finds its way to the French and English versions. Um, so the paraphrase misses the name of the German, Labs, okay? Uh, I say to him, Labs, let him go, to the German. And it also misses the image of the relations in the village. It also partly misses the mockery of the guard's answer um, with the gesture of pointing up to, sky, to the sky. And above all, it misses the narrative strategy of memory activation and construction. 
Um, we claim that memory lingers also very strongly in the positioning of the self within the narrative of the testimony. In its complete shape, the scene shows that the Polish bystanders know what they have seen. Uh, they saw it from a very close distance. They took part in these scenes uh, and they can even remember full phrases said in the past uh, together as well as gestures and tones. Um, this is all very, very uh, short insight into what we were doing and the kind of analysis we were, uh, we were trying to, uh, um, to uh, uh, conduct on this very rich material. Um, it, it's time for conclusions, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, again, to quote Gary Weissman, um, he speaks about amended transcripts uh, in the context of Hebrew uh, testimonies in Shoah. And he says that they bring us closer to an understanding of those words as they are produced through interlingual dialogue by matching the tone and voice, gesticulations, body language of speakers with their enunciations. As a result, Weissman claims the interviewee would appear to speak for himself rather than being spoken for. This was exactly one of the objectives of this uh, project we undertook at the Agilonian. Um, looking at these testimonies through the lens of translations uh, has revealed not only lexical and aesthetic dilemmas, but above all, ethical ones. Uh, it requires looking beyond the language into the biography of individual speakers to bring back their identities and stories behind the positions they, uh, the positions they took and opinions uh, they voiced. We want to give the bystanders their voices back. Still, it is not just a question of giving justice to individual experience and memory, uh, we think. By studying how the Helmians speak and what speaks through them, by revealing the work of memory, self-creation and emotions contained in the statements, we can research into models, modes and models of remembering growing out of a particular environment from the combination of the particular language, place and experience during the war and after it. Um, a close analysis of the linguistic features of interviewee statements, which are completely lost in translation. Uh, we are essentially also, in, and they were essentially also inaccessible to the director, but it complicates the interpretation of the bystanders' attitudes and demonstrate the complexity of this material, which cannot be approached from one perspective and one conceptual framework only. Multilingual character of the testimonies need a multidimensional approach and more refined analytic tools. Roma? So, to, uh, just to oh, add a few, yeah, for a few words to what, what Magda said, uh, perhaps I would uh, only add one small uh, paragraph. So, bystander, as you see, deliver facts, uh, images, uh, they rescue words, uh, even full sentences, portions of dialogue from the past. It's distorted, it's fragmented. Uh, but I, I think this, we think this communication is worth analysis with a basic assumption of its truthfulness uh, as testimony. Uh, in the light of the growth of bystander studies, a pre-imposed la labeling of bystanders' testimony as false, fabricated, manipulated, based on phantasm or lie is, of course, detrimental. We cannot make any f step further in bystander studies if we assume this kind of distortion. Uh, so new attention to uh, bystanders' actual utterances and the various contexts they stem from can help re-examine classic documents like Shoah by Landsman and also new findings with a scrutiny equal to this developed for the survivors' accounts, not in order to release the speakers and their communities from complicity, but to uh, reveal multifaceted and complex processes of implication that take us beyond the political manipulation and abuse of the perpetrator-victim dichotomy in the past conflicts. Or to use Michael Rothberg's recent claim, it may foster new and much needed attention to how we are folded into or implicated uh, in events that at first seem beyond our agency as individual subjects, such a detailed knowledge might turn out to be invaluable in responding to ongoing and future conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. 
thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And we are <coughs> carrying on with, uh, with uh, Claude Lanzmann with the next presentation by uh, Sue Weiss and uh, Dominic Williams uh, on local and symbolic space or spaces in Claude Lanzmann's uh, Shoah outtakes. And maybe I will first introduce the speakers. Uh, Sue Weiss is professor of English literature at the University of Sheffield um, and her recent publications include the BFI Mo Modern Film Classics Volume on Shoah, the co-edited uh, co volume Representing Perpetrators in Holocaust Literature and uh, Film, uh, which she published together with Jenny Adams, Textual Depictions, False Memories and li Literary um, Hoax in, uh, contemporary, uh, in Contemporary Era, and also uh, Barry Highness, Kess Threats and Beyond with da David Forrest. And uh, her study of Claude Lanzmann's Shoah outtakes will be published uh, next year. And Dominic um, Williams, hello, a senior lecturer in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at uh, Northumbria University, UK. And uh, with Nicolas Haar, uh, he has uh, co-authored and also co-edited four books uh, on in Holocaust studies. Most recently, he co-authored a volume entitled Testimonies of Resistance, Representations of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Sonderkommanda, uh, which was published at uh, Berghahn Books uh, in 2019. And uh, we will be happy to listen or will be... Uh, uh, well, curious to listen to your presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I assume you can. That you can. Hooray. Um, I'm just going to try and operate the clicker. There we are. Um, Dominic and I are really delighted to be here. And um, our talk is a kind of compliment to what we've just heard. I was amazed to hear that LARBS is mentioned um, in the suppressed dialogue. Um, because Lanceman tried to interview him later, so how bizarre that he cut him out. Um, most studies, as we've heard, of Shoah's outtakes have focused on the interviews. But there's a further 30 hours from the 220 hours in total of the outtakes that's listed as location footage. Lanceman himself often described the film as being about, about an event that was still present in what he called I quote, the scars freshly and vividly inscribed in places and conscious consciences. In this talk, we'll consider what the outtakes can tell us about this aspect, which Lanceman gave equal weight to survivors' words, that of space and of a specifically spatial memory. As we'll argue in two case studies of Polish locations, Lanceman's position led to a particular way of reading landscapes and places, attentive to the gaps where nothing remains and to those sites where little has changed, but paying less attention and at points willfully ignoring um, those kinds of official memory, including the spaces of memorials, so that if they're visible at all, they appear in unclear or ambivalent form. The priority instead despite Lanceman's stated preference, is given to symbolic imagery. Um, mm. It says attempting to reconnect, perhaps it will. Yes, hooray. Um, our first example is passageways in the city of Łódź. In contrast to the outtake film of the camps at Majdanek and Belzec's, the footage of Woods invites us to recall a murderous history through everyday settings. In this case, the 45 minutes of outtake footage demands the viewer's interpretive or even suspicious gaze to understand the presence of the past in what seems to be an unremarkable cityscape, including its station, inner city courtyards, historic buildings, market and cemetery. The camera's pausing on apparently accidental details contrasts with tracking shots of street scenes and trams and suggests moments where communal memory is crystallized into a single image. That these details are not 
historical sites or artefacts, signals that we're in the presence of a filmic version of memories, condensation and displacement, rather than that of a documentary record. In the footage of the city, we do see locations which we can identify, such as the Poznansky factory, Poznansky palace and Wuzhkalishka railway station, which are identified by visible signs or voices. The palace, which had been the city museum for four years in 1979 at the time of filming, and the factory, which was still in operation at that moment, convey the layers of Jewish history in Wuj. The buildings are named after the cotton manufacturer Israel Poznansky from the 19th century heyday of the community's life. In contrast to the war, during which the factory's location placed it just outside the ghetto, while the palace was requisitioned for use as the German headquarters. The focus on Kaliska is more mysterious, and if anyone has any thoughts about this, we'll be very grateful to hear them. Since it was rather from the station at Radagosch that deportation trains left for the camps of Halno and Auschwitz. However, it seems that the present day Kaliska, its passengers filmed coming and going, studying timetables and even catching the camera operator's eye, is used as a metonym for the process of deportation by train because the disused and ruined nature of Radagosh in 1979 meant that it could not be easily filmed. Although Kaliska's name appears, as you can see in the next slide, when it reconnects, if you can just make out, you can see the word Wuj highlighted. Kaliska is there, but it's almost invisible, suggesting that the memory of the past summoned up here would be through the use of a cinematic signifier different from its geographical original. But it's the anonymous everyday locations that are, by contrast to the ones that I've already mentioned, the most striking examples of spatial memory in the representation of Wuj, for the very reason that their historical status is often unidentifiable. There are testifiers whose voices this footage could have accompanied, maybe Simon Shrebnik could have been one of them, um, but including also in Shoah, the ghetto survivor Paula Byron, who talks about being moved into cramped quarters there, or the German settler Martha Michelson, who uses the Nazi era name Lichmannstadt Ghetto. But if they were used, it would be in an elusive and not an illustrative way. This is the case in several sequences which show old and rundown courtyards in what is named on the clapperboard in French, which we can see as Poland Winter Lodge Ghetto. While the season of filming in the present, that of winter, is acknowledged, the persistence of the past is also implied. The location is not referred to as Bawuti, where the filming took place, but in terms of the area's wartime status as a ghetto. And we hear the sound recordist's pronunciation of the Yiddish name of the city, Lodge, as a linguistic return to the past. In Bawuti, the camera tracks from the main street into a series of what Maurice Halbwax, in his theory of communal spatial memory, calls those obscure passageways that are likely to contain islands of the past. In this case, these look like the passages into a specific history. Um, however, what the camera shows us in its journey through these alleyways and into courtyards is imagery that summons up the past in symbolic and not historical ways. For instance, the camera lingers as you can see in this next shot, um, on the suddenly colourful appearance amid all the grey of a man in a pink pullover looking out through a window, an apparently chance detail that embodies the notion of eyewitness, one which is also conveyed architecturally in a lot of footage of balconies and stairways. Um, and now with any luck we'll watch a couple of clips of scenes of the last two imagery of symbols. The first shows a letter and the second a child. Uh, 
Oh, it, it worked, so just go back, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Go back, Did jump, I... go forward. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I'm being impatient. Hang on. Just leave it. Okay. Okay, um, so in the first example, it's the very fact of the camera's repeated returns to that large letter Z, thank you, Dominic. Um, though it's hard to know what to look at, it seems that the letter is really highlighted. It's painted onto a wall under a balcony, and it might prompt us, the very act of the return of the camera, that is, might prompt us to see it as an incomplete version of the word Zid, or the Polish for Jew. The enigmatic letter's position and the cameras following its focus on the letter by panning up to the window above it turns this wall into a space that is marked by Jewish absence. In the second instance of embodiment, we see the child who you just saw trudging in winter clothes, walking down the street towards the camera in a manner that's so self-conscious and deliberate that it seems this scene must have been staged in contrast to the other ones. Although people are not usually used as figures for past affronts in the way that such objects as trains, water and smoke are in Shoah, in this case, we might recall the particular fate of children in the Wuj ghetto. In her interview, Paula Byron repeats the words from a friend about the sending of those aged under nine to an unknown destination, as she says, those children will be killed. Dominic. The outtake footage of the Action Reinhardt camp of Belgets is revealing as much for what is not filmed as for what actually appears. Its short length, 22 minutes, clearly indicates that by the time Lonsman and his team visited the site, they had already decided that it would not play a major part in Shoah. Its role in the film itself is so small that many viewers, including us as viewers, must forget or fail to notice that it is there at all. At about eight and a half hours in, when viewers' faculties are perhaps not at their sharpest, two minutes of footage are matched to conversation in voiceover between Lonsman and Raoul Hilberg. As Hilberg discusses how much Adam Chernyakov knew about death camps such as Belgets, five shots of a sand pit, piles of timber, trains, and railway buildings are shown, ending with a zoom in on the railway station sign. The emptiness of the pit matches Chernyakov's silence in his diary about such places. The pinpointing of location provided by the station's name corresponds to Hilberg's assertion that people in the Warsaw Ghetto nonetheless did have some knowledge of death camp's existence. There are some elements in the outtakes that are not included in the film, most notably two shots taken from inside a car as it drives up to the gates of the grounds, in similar ways to how the approaches to Birkenau and Treblinka appear in the film and how an approach to the Vorlage of Sobibor uh, appears in the outtakes. But what is striking is how much of the excluded content is simply the same as what made it into the final cut, sand, wood, railways. There was more to be filmed in 1979, even in this location, however. 
in these two takes in which we see the car rolling up to the camp gates in the middle distance at first and then appearing a few hundred meters up the slope on the other side of the fence is a white nondescript structure popping in and out of frame and behind and between trees. I've just highlighted it here in take two and now in take one. We can also just about make out a ready brown slab of sandstone to the left of the gate. From its position and shape, it's possible to identify the white cuboid as the camp memorial erected in 1963. The sandstone is barely visible in the outtakes, but comparison with Belgette's memorial's um, photograph there from their Facebook site, I think it clearly is there. Um, and this is a memorial plaque from the late 1970s which specifically acknowledged Jewish deaths alongside insisting that there were also Poles who suffered for helping them. In neither case were the words on them filmed, though, although in other outtakes, um, similar memorials are, such as this one from Chelmno. But once the not white 1963 memorial has been identified, it is possible to perceive it in later footage and in fact in the final film too. I've shortened this sequence so it's the five shots, but only one of them is the full length, and that's this one here, which is a zoom out. In Shoah, the editing process makes that memorial nigh on unrecognizable as a memorial, or even as what the camera is looking at. In the outtakes, however, and I've speeded these up, although it's playing a little bit slow over the internet, but it's speeded up anyway, I think. In these outtakes, zooms and pans end repeatedly with the memorial in the center of the frame. Those white sticks with red tops mark the level crossing that the car that drives up to the gates drives over. What we see in these outtakes makes sense if we see the camera operator using the memorial as a marker for the site. Here, as with other location footage, repetition helps the viewer to make some sense of what is being filmed, although in this case, perhaps some supplementary knowledge of the location itself seems necessary. As it's edited into the final film, the shot in which the memorial appears links the sand of the previous two shots to the railways of the next two through its zoom out from log piles to train tracks without any zoom in being included. So it looks in this context like a shot of a pile of logs with some nondescript structure in the background. Editing after filming therefore made the memorial even less likely to attract the viewer's attention. The set of signs that stand for Belgettes was limited to sand, wood and railways. Sand in particular symbolizes the site instead of the rather dilapidated memorial landscape that was so cursorily filmed. But the sand pit, which the final film calls Belgettes, was almost certainly outside the grounds at the time. You can see here the sandy slope, which seems to be the only sandy slope in this location, filmed in 2002 and 1998. And that's the slope that corresponds to the slope marked on that map on the right at the left, parallel with the left had edge and outside the camp, uh, outside the grounds perimeter, the memorial grounds perimeter. The map was drawn by the um, archaeologist Angelis Koller. That slope marks what had originally, I think, been an anti-tank ditch, which may have been used to bury bodies and is at any rate close to the mass graves Koller identified and that um, are on that side of the memorial grounds. In this loose soil, it's also likely that remains shifted away from the graves themselves, and so um, might have been present in the ground where Lance Mann was filming. So it's not quite right to say that the film is making an untrue claim by making this pit the site of the camp, but that claim is rather misleading. The emptiness 
of the sandpit stands for the silences of Chemyakov and for the lack of survivors, but also implies complete forgetting and neglect on the part of Polish people and state. We only know that this is Belzec because it's insistently labelled by caption, voiceover and station sign. As a sight in the film, especially in the focus on sand, it really seems to be nothing, nowhere, the archetype of what Lanzmann called a non-lieu de la mémoire. We might say then that it only takes on significance as the name Belgez is applied to it. But I think something else might be said to be going on. This insistent focus on the name and nothing else strips the site of significance, empties it of meaning, makes it readable simply as a point in space where this thing happened. It seems to me then that this site is being made to stand for there being nothing there, that this is part of a very particular claim that there is nothing, and that this has been part of the claims of the unrepresentability of the shower. But what we see here, both in the choices made in recording the raw footage and in the way that that footage was edited into the final film itself, is unrepresentability being produced, not simply being grappled with. I've chosen examples then of traces of the former ghetto of Wuch and the remains at the camp of Belgetz show how Lonsman and his team responded to the fact that the Holocaust was a geographical and indeed a spatial crime, as Tim Cole says. Not only did the genocide involve the mass dislocation and deportation of people as encoded by the shots of trains and stations in Shoah and the outtakes alike, but also the creation, repurposing and disguise of locations for a murderous purpose. This material's unedited status often makes it hard for the viewer to know where to look in the frame, especially when the shots are of sites whose appearance has dramatically changed since the moment of filming in 1979. However, these apparent obstacles allow us to understand the different modes of recalling atrocity in spatial terms by such decisions on the part of Lanzmann's crew as that to prioritise buildings and landscapes, as well as signs, notices, narratorial utterance and elusive objects. In most cases, these motifs take priority over officially sanctioned memorial architecture. The process of constructing a visual impression of abandoned or apparently anonymous non-sites and establishing the metonymic role of settings or images to stand for the locations of past affronts is made clear in the very act of representing their contemporary appearance and extent. The unedited archival footage itself becomes the site of remembrance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think all the three presentations uh, kind of add to a total deconstruction of Claude Lanzmann Shoah, and I'm sure we will discuss it um, again later on. The last presentation in our panel deals with a slightly different issue, but also, of course, connected to translation and Holocaust and translation, and it will be the presentation by uh, Peter Davis on knowledge, testimony, testimony, translation, and the interpreters at the first Frankfurt uh, Auschwitz uh, trial. And let me introduce Professor um, Peter Davis, uh, is Professor of Modern German Studies at the University of Edinburgh. And he has published widely on the challenges posed by translation for, uh, for our understanding of the Holocaust uh, or Holocaust testimonies and on the ethical issues uh, faced by translating translators of, of, of these. His most recent publications are The Witness Between Languages, The Translation of Holocaust Testimonies in Context, which was published 2018, and uh, another book published together with uh, Jean, uh, Jean uh, Bos Bayer uh, and Andrea uh, Hamel and uh, Miriam Winters uh, on Translating Holocaust Lives, which was published 2017 by Bloomsbury. And uh, uh, Professor David uh, Davis, uh, the floor is yours. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, 
And also, I'm going to say I'm going to find it very difficult to follow these wonderfully subtle readings of questions of interpreting in the film Showa. So I'm not even going to try, but I'm going to take a rather different angle on the issue of translation. But I hope there are going to be some points of contact that we can maybe uh, work on um, in a discussion. I'm also going to be talking about interpreters, as with the other talks, but in a rather different context. Now, unlike for the Nuremberg trials and other genocide tribunals, there is as yet little work on the translators and interpreters who worked for the court during the trials of former SS Auschwitz personnel in Frankfurt in the mid-1960s. We have some biographical details, but we know little about their working conditions, their education, their self-image as a professional group, their feelings and emotional stress when translating survivors' testimonies. What did they want? How were they advised? Did they have political intentions? Did they identify with the witnesses or with the prosecution or with the legal system and the court instances? Did they want to assist the witnesses or keep a professional distance? Is there in fact any neutral position that an interpreter can take in a situation like this? We hear their voices, but as so often with translators and interpreters, we overhear them. We take their work for granted, unless something goes wrong, in which case they get the blame. My pointer is not to judge whether they translated well or badly, but to understand how communication between witnesses, judges, other court personnel and interpreters worked in this particular situation. And above all, to show how this specific kind of testimony, testimony in court, is created. For this project, I'm using the sound recordings of the witness testimonies from the trial, preserved and curated by the Fritz Bauer Institute in Frankfurt am Main. They form part of the extensive archive of the trial, which was awarded UNESCO Memory of the World status in 2017. The archive has been digitized by the Hessen State Archive, and the many hours of tape testimony are freely available through the website of the Fritz Bauer Institute. I have to say it's a spectacular, openly available resource, which incidentally, one can work on from home during lockdown. So that's been fabulous for me. Now, I'm not a historian, so I don't read and listen to these testimonies in the same way as the many excellent historians of the trial, such as Devin Pendas, Rebecca Whitman, Raphael Gross, or Katharina Stengel and many others. I don't read them as historical sources or legal documents, but as linguistic events, as testimonies unfolding in time that emerge in the dynamics of interaction between the participants in a particular sociolinguistic context. In her study of translating at the UN Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Ellen Elias Borsac has described the dilemma of the interpreter in terms of competing demands which are concealed by ideas of neutrality or metaphors like conduit or bridge, which we often use for interpreters. The interpreter has to negotiate the demands of verbatimness, that is to translate only what was said, and readability, that is to make statements comprehensible, while preserving the integrity of the trial itself. Ultimately, the witness needs to be made readable in terms of the court's knowledge discourses, which work along lines structured by a specific view of truth and falsehood, reliability and unreliability. Added to this is the need of the interpreter to preserve face in a situation of high visibility. Their professional integrity is at stake in the way they deal with these conflicting demands. The complexity and tempo of the situation make deliberate bias hard to sustain, but interpreters do develop strategies to deal with the demands of the specific situation and the character of the witness. These help them navigate a long testimony and can give us important information about the ethical choices they are making. So it's a situation of ethical choice and strategy rather than bias. Bias is really, really rare in interpreting in this kind of situation. The complexity of the linguistic situation in the courtroom and the variety of roles the interpreters play within it provides a good illustration of the interaction of power and language in context. Necessary fictions of interpreter objectivity, a simple conduit for the words of the speaker, disguise the complexity of the interaction, the agency and influence of the interpreter, the way that other participations intervene and take on the role of interpreter themselves at different times, claiming to understand what's going on, and the role of the interpreter in shaping and controlling both the interaction and the way the testimony is framed. And we should also not forget that interpreting is an interpersonal interaction rather than simply an intercultural one. Devin Pendas, in his History of the Trial, 
has pointed out the different perceptions of the trial on the part of the victims who saw the trial as a means to an end and the judiciary who saw the neutrality and legitimacy of the court as an end in itself. For the interpreters, this meant that they had to mediate not only linguistically, but also between, I quote, the experiential truth of Auschwitz as a site of pain and loss and the legal truth of Auschwitz as a site of minutely specifiable criminal acts, end quote. The court generates knowledge about the victims that is recognizable and usable as knowledge within the framework of the trial. A German court tries to generate knowledge from the experiences of the victims of persecution, expulsion and violence that can be evaluated using legal concepts. The court, and therefore the law and the state, is the norm within which the victim witnesses have to perform their testimony. And the memories, feelings, desires, suffering they bring with them, a knowledge carried in the body sitting or standing in the courtroom, must adapt to this norm in order to be perceived as knowledge at all. Witness statements have to undergo two modes of translation, into the language of the court and into the discourse of the court. The court proceedings are officially in standard German, but all forms of speech have, have also to be translated into a form that can be interpreted in the knowledge generation processes of the court. So a form of knowledge that's personal, subjective and embodied needs to be made available for a different set of criteria. Witnesses themselves become in this process objects of knowledge rather than subjects. The fiction of interpreting, that's a convenient fiction for the court, is that the interpreter only translates into the language of the court rather than also into the discourse. The interpreter already participates in the formulation of the testimony before the witness even speaks. Partly this is to do with the structure of an interpreted courtroom exchange, but it's also influenced by the individual interpreter's performance of the role. The interpreter is the witness's main interlocutor, and a lot depends on whether the witness sees the interpreter as supporter, guide and advisor, or as part of the court apparatus. The fact that the Frankfurt interpreters sat next to the witnesses rather than in a booth, as they had done in Nuremberg, was a significant element affecting the quality of the interaction of the court. It feels much more personal and much more intimate. But in an interpreted courtroom exchange, the structure, rhythm, tone and duration of a testimony are determined by the interpreter and by the interactions that arise from interpreting. The interpreter plays the role of active manager of the testimony situation, coordinating the exchanges, organising the witness's discourse and making it accessible to the court, not only in purely interlingual terms, but also contributing to making it, to use Adorno's words, commensurable with the court's knowledge processes. As part of this contribution and as the primary point of contact for the witness, they are inevitably also part of the disciplinary apparatus of the court, not just transmitting directions from the judges, but also anticipating them. The interpreted testimony show many instances of interpreters instructing witnesses to answer the question, please, to listen to the whole question before answering, to allow the interpreter to finish before speaking again. So interpreters help to determine the overall structure of a testimony and to position the witness in a way that's useful. Interpreters are therefore facilitators and co-creators of the testimony. They are persons acting on their own initiative with their own wishes, ideas, perspectives and interpretations of both the events in Auschwitz and the work of the court. Their translation practice can thus also be read as a commentary. How should one translate in such a situation? Who are they working for? From whose perspective is one translating and what is it that needs to be conveyed? Facts, feelings, intonation, opinions or all together at once. There's really no ethically neutral objective position for an interpreter here. And since as far as I can ascertain there were no generally valid guidelines for the interpreters at the Frankfurt trials, I've never found anything like this in the trial documentation. The trial documents can be used to analyse the ethical decisions of the individual interpreters in this complex and delicate situation. As public servants, they've taken an oath to translate accurately and conscientiously, which they do. But their choices are often very different, even while falling within the bounds of good professional practice. One can, for example, show solidarity with the winds, or try to protect him or her. One could strive for neutrality or objectivity. One can try to be helpful by interpreting the feelings or intentions of the witness or mediate or intensify conflicts. 
One can bring incoherent statements into the clear language of the court. One can clarify factual questions for the witness or strive for clear, emotionally neutral descriptions of persons, places or actions. One can, as interpreter, correct statements made by the witnesses or even by the judges. You can influence or direct the, di uh, the direction or tempo of the statement or perhaps even demonstratively take a chance, uh, uh, take, take a stance through the choice of words. In any case, they actively participate in shaping the testimony. In the course of a long testimony over several hours, we can observe how the interpreter's attitude and the relationship between the participants changes according to the situation. Where do conflicts, misunderstandings, power struggles or tensions arise, or even short-term collaborations and moments of solidarity? Given the multilingualism of many of the witnesses and of their speech at the trial, an important disciplinary function arises from interpreters' role in pinning the witnesses down to one specific language. The interpreter Vera Kapkaev's impatience at the linguistic switching of the witness Simon Gortland is a good example. Gortland, a Polish Jew now living in France, switches rapidly in his testimony between Polish, Yiddish, German and French, exasperating the interpreter and provoking repetitions of the phrase from her, niech pan mówi po polsku, please speak Polish. She gets very impatient with him and keeps repeating this phrase over and over again. From the perspective of a court with an official language and a set of linguistic rules, this is vital, but it sets up Polish and German as two entirely separate worlds of communication and pins the witness to one of them. It also creates the impression of Gortland as a confused, linguistically incompetent speaker and bad witness, rather than an individual with a unique set of experiences, a telling linguistic biography, and a remarkable way, a hybrid way, of expressing himself. His hybrid mode of speech between these four languages is read as by the court and by the interpreter as a sign of linguistic deficit, rather than as a reflection of his complex ling linguistic biography. He experienced Auschwitz, after all, through a variety of languages and hybrid forms, and has reflected on his experiences using other languages, specifically French. Gortland's speech does not always make clear distinctions between French, Yiddish, Polish and German, but these have to be separated for the court and to make the work of the interpreter even possible. A single language is not necessarily a meaningful mode of communication, either for the experience of Auschwitz or for the experiences of the witnesses afterwards. The idea of entirely separate languages with boundaries between them patrolled by the interpreter is a construct of the power relations in the courtroom and it works against the interests of the witness. It's therefore not a case of saying that things are expressed differently in different languages, but of identifying the moments of hybridity and working out the meanings attached to expression in each language. Once we accept this, we can start to think about how Gortland's mode of speech gives us insights into the language of the prisoners more generally and consider what it means to be considered a limited speaker of national standard languages rather than as a powerful speaker of the language of the prisoners. This is an ambiguous and ethically fraught position for the interpreter. Helping and supporting the witness also entails controlling him and making him available as an object of knowledge. Simon Gortland literally possesses no speech that's adequate to the court. The interpreter Vera Kapkaev has to establish in her work a form of coherence that is useful for the court. This is really important for her professional practice as well and a saving face in the court situation. These sources of the trial, these recorded testimonies are complex, contradictory and rich in information. It's impossible in a talk like this to give any kind of impression of the richness of these recordings, especially with regard to the dynamics of the relationship between the trial participants. I really, really recommend that people go and look at these things and listen to them themselves, they're fantastic. Witnesses, interpreters, judges and the other parties of the trial are involved in the process of creating a testimony in which absolutely essential things are negotiated about the validity of different types of knowledge, about notions of neutrality or non-partisanship in the court in this particular historical context, about the purpose and addressee of the witness statements, about the different status of the languages in which testimony is given, and about different fundamental conceptions of truth. There's only space here for one tiny example, but I think it opens up a vast space for further research on these testimonies. During his witness testimony on January the 14th, 1965, Milton Buki, 
a survivor of the Auschwitz Sonderkommando who traveled from Los Angeles to be at the court, spoke in a mixture of German and Yiddish with occasional interjections of English. He is assisted by the Yiddish German interpreter Moritz Grünblatt, although the judges often understand him, or they think they do. At the very beginning of his interrogation, there is a short exchange of words, which is easily overheard, but which reveals something about the complex task of the, task of the interpreters at the trial. The leading judge asks a series of formal questions, happens at the beginning of every testimony, establishing the witness's name, age, marital status, occupation, and place of residence. These are, of course, already known to the court, but they serve to authenticate the testimony as the voice of an identifiable, unique individual, and also to affirm the genre of legal testimony within the institutional structure of the court's linguistic practices. The last question in this series is designed to confirm the neutrality of the witness and goes in German, und sie sind nicht verwandt und nicht verschwägert mit den Angeklagten, and you are not related by blood or marriage to any of the accused. This question, in itself normal and legitimate in the courtroom, is often a moment of tension in these testimonies, right at the beginning of their testimony. Witnesses sometimes gasp or laugh or show contempt at the very idea of being related to these people. One gets a very strong feeling of their personality, attitudes and emotions in this moment. And it's something that only comes across in a recording. You can't get this in a transcript of the trial, you have to hear it. After listening to Grunbat's Yiddish translation of this phrase, Buki answers neither yes nor no, but instead just mutters under his breath, Schande, shame or outrage. Grunbat hurries to translate this for the court. Das wäre für ihn eine Schande, erklärt der Zeuge, he says. This would be shameful for him, the witness explains. What must Interpreter Grunbach translate here? What's his task? The judge's question about the relationship to the accused provokes the horrified, half-whispered answer, Schande, shame. And the interpreter intervenes to explain what it means. The similarity of the German word Schande to the Yiddish word Schande allows a person who understands German to believe that they've understood what this is all about. It would be a disgrace for Mr. Buki if he were related to one of the defendants. So it's his problem and the court can overlook it. But there is another possibility. It may just as well be that Buki finds the judge's question shameful, something outrageous, an insult against which he protests. The shame in this case would lie with the court and not with the victim. The interpreter Grünblatt reacts quickly and defuses the situation by trying to make it clear to the court that it was not meant that way. His cautious ling linguistic distancing from the witness shows that he is clearly positioning himself on the side of the court when trying to mediate between the parties, even when he appears to be taking the witness side. He's not just interpreting the language, but explaining the witness for the court's benefit. Potential other meanings in Buki's statement are passed over in order to help the proceedings to move on without a hitch. Now, perhaps this is a small thing, but it's worthwhile to sharpen one's ear for such moments in order to understand a, a point that may be obvious, but is nevertheless complex. It's not only language that's translated. Now, to conclude, I don't agree with critics such as James Young or Elida Asman who find that this trial testimony is less valuable than other kinds of testimony. This is a unique testimony given situation and therefore gives us unique insights that are not available elsewhere. One hears things that one does not hear elsewhere in other kinds of testimony. It also makes power structures and institutional contexts visible that are often otherwise hidden or implicit and shows us that testimony is always a collaborative act that unfolds in a communicative context in which different participations are negotiating different intentions and different approaches to knowledge. And finally, it forces us to keep the work of translators and interpreters at the front of our mind as co-producers of knowledge, rather than keeping them conveniently invisible. Now, when thinking about the local dimensions of the Holocaust, as we are on this panel, I think we can use studies of trial testimony to extend that thinking beyond micro-historical approaches to Holocaust per perpetration. Their interest for me lies less in their value as historical sources they are useful as sources, but they have a, there's a whole range of caveats associated with them for a historian, I think. But in what they reveal about the conditions of speaking, so they tell us more about the local context of expression, 
than the local context of the experience. They force us to think about the sociolinguistic and uh, sociological context of witnessing as a communicative act unfolding in time in a specific situation with its own linguistic rituals, rules of performance and power structures. We need to think about these things if we are to understand them at all. They show us that the linguistic context can't be taken for granted, that languages are not rather abstract, separate worlds between which one can just translate or mediate, or which present philosophical problems of untranslatability or ethical problems of fidelity. But languages are dynamic hybrid systems with many points of contact and conflict. Individuals, such as Simon Gotland, um, can struggle to find appropriate modes of expression for what they've experienced within the institutional linguistic rules that structure the role of witness. So finally, publishing, legal and political institutions, memorials, scholarship and the institutional collection of testimonies, all of these depend on the imposition or choice of a specific individual language and a set of linguistic practices with translators and interpreters where necessary acting as expert mediators. Their role in these institutional contexts is paradoxical, that is, translators. Translators build bridges while also maintaining boundaries, and then they disappear, or at least they're supposed to. So here's a utopian thought to finish with. When thinking about the local dimensions of the Holocaust, employ translators or think about translators as guides to the complex linguistic territory in which the Holocaust took place and in which the witnesses have formulated their testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think now after all those four presentations, we have lots of material to think of and lots of things to digest. And uh, <clears throat> the person who will help us with us is uh, Tomasz Wysak, who will, um, who will try to comment on, on, on your presentations before we uh, go into the discussion. And Tomasz Wysak holds a PhD from the Warsaw University and he works uh, his work focuses on representations of Holocaust in relation to trauma studies and uh, psychoanalysis. And he has held um, fellowships at the University of Washington, Seattle, the University of Edinburgh and uh, the University of Chicago and has been awarded a research grant from the National Sci Science Center titled uh, From Newsreel to Post-Traumatic Film Documentary and Artistic Films on, on the Holocaust and he has published numerous um, articles and also edited volumes and uh, is also author of uh, a book entitled um, Od Kroniki do Filmu Posttraumatycznego Filmy Dokumentalne o Zagładzie so from a chronicle to post-traumatic films documentaries about the Holocaust which was published 2016 um, and which has been awarded uh, as the best debut book in cinema and media studies by the Polish Association for Studies of Film and Media and is, um, mm, has been recently working on Polish popular culture and uh, the color Holocaust. And please, uh, uh, Tomasz, if uh, you could share with us your comments. Okay, thank you, Sofia, for this kind introduction. And um, um, I have an opportunity to comment on the panel, um, which is really special to me in the sense that um, I know almost um, every presenter on this panel, which uh, I would say doesn't happen too often. So um, the four presentations in the panel, in my opinion, deal with two general issues. So the first issue being the nature and practice of audio and audiovisual testimony. And the second issue, the necessity to reasset Claude Lanzmann's Shoah in the light of what we learned about the film, studying the outtakes, as well as, as attentively rewatching it. And I think that to study testimony now is to transcend the psychoanalytical tradition, which posits it as an individual act of commemorating, an example of deep memory, um, or an involuntary return to the past. However, when we look at the history of gathering testimony, it turns out that for a long time after the war, testimony was a collaborative endeavor with the relations of power favoring interviewers 
or interpreters. Therefore, it is justified to ask a general question. Who owns testimony? The answer to this question of ownership depends on the circumstances of giving testimony, and a number of examples. Does the witness recognize and adhere to the rules of a given testimonial practice? Is there any resistance to these rules? What is the interviewer interested in? So are they facts, narratives, accusation, maybe a moving story, a psychological breakthrough? And we can enumerate uh, more of these um, interests. And um, I'm going to start with um, the last presentation in this panel. Um, and then I'm going to move to uh, uh, presentations on Claude Lanzmann's Shaw in the chronological order. So Peter Davies works on recently digitized audio recordings of the Frankfurt trial of the SS guards at the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. And um, I think that the importance of working with the original voice recordings cannot be overestimated, uh, meaning that you need to work with the audio files rather than with the transcripts. Um, and we have another body of testimonies that were recorded quite uh, early and much earlier than um, the Frankfurt trial. Uh, and these are the testimonies uh, that were collected in the mid-1940s mid by um, David Bodder, which are also available uh, in, a, uh, in an audio uh, form. And Davies introduces linguistics as a methodology to study testimony in order to enrich the study of testimony, which was dominated initially by literary scholars and psychologists, and it was reluctantly entered by historians in the 1990s. In the context of the courtroom, Davies stresses the need to recognize the scopus of translation, namely its goal, as a situation in which, I quote, ultimately the witness needs to be made readable in terms of the court's knowledge discourses, which work along lines structured by a specific view of truth and falsehood, reliability and unreliability, end of quote. Therefore, testimony should be delivered and formatted so that it is useful in the courtroom. By asserting a double goal of the translation into the language of the court and into its uh, discourse, Davies stresses the power relations between the court and the witness mediated by a translator. Thus, testifying and translating are two parallel procedures serving the same goal. Effectively, these are translators who are responsible for making any given testimony useful for the court. Their role is to guard the rules established by the judicial procedure. However, one cannot forget about the intentionality of witnesses who bring their own agenda to the courtroom. Uh, Simon Gotland's testimony is a telling example in this respect. His multilingual narrative is a nightmare for the interpreter, but as Davies observes, it, show, it shows the witness's intention to master his own fragmented story, a multitude of languages being a symbol of its complexity. In conclusion, Davies calls testimony a collaborative act, and I think it's, uh, it's really similar uh, to uh, what we have in a really famous uh, graphic novel about the Holocaust, namely Arch Spiegelman's Mouse, which was called on a, number of uh, on a number of occasions a collaborative autobiography. The power relations were different, but the concept of sharing responsibility for testimony is, uh, is there. Let us now turn to studying Claude Lanzmann's Shaw. And uh, I would like to ask another general question. What is the purpose of studying uh, the outtakes? So I would say that there are three main purposes. The first of our, our, our goals, the first of them being to elucidate the documentary by reconstructing Lanzmann's thought process in picking fragments of testimony. 
and that would be Dorota Głowacka's position uh, here. To treat them as an archive of what could have been, and that would be uh, Sue Weiss and Dominic Williams. And finally, to treat them as an audiovisual text in, the, um, in its own right, and that would be again uh, Sue Weiss and Dominic Williams. So uh, now my comments to uh, Dorota's uh, presentation. Dorota Głowacka sets out to debunk a certain reading of the Holocaust put forward by Claude Lanzmann in his film, namely, uh, I quote, to unmask Polish prejudices and hostility toward the Jews, end of quote, as the only position taken by the Polish witnesses. In order to show the enmity between these two groups, the Polish language, in her opinion, is put on trial in the documentary, but the defendant, but the defendant is misrepresented by a less than perfect translation. According to Głowacka, it amounts to a linguistic revenge by means of misspelling of proper names, and that is also a colonial, uh, a colonial gesture uh, to rename sites of, uh, of murder. In spite of the chasm between Polish and Jewish witnesses stressed by the filmmaker, Głowacka identifies moments of co-witnessing on the margin of what is recorded by the camera and invited by Landsman. The critic protests against the simplification of a complex linguistics exchange in the translation and points out that the selection of the film material makes a false impression of Srebnik as a silent witness, inarticulate about his past. Reclaiming Srebnik as a fluent speaker of Polish opens a space for co-witnessing with other Poles and changes the reading of the famous scene in front of the church in Helmno. Srebnik no longer appears as a helpless victim, re-traumatized by Polish witnesses, but as an eloquent speaker in his own right. Now my comments to Roma Sendyka and Magda Heidel. Uh, they choose a different strategy to uh, reinterpret an exchange between villagers in Helmno in front of the church. They listen closely to untranslated and at times barely audible utterances of Polish bystanders to insert them back into the film, from which they have been edited out in the process of consecutive on-site interpreting by Barbara Janicka, Landsman's translator from Polish. On the one hand, Sendyka and Heidel reintroduce Polish vernacular into the film, and on the other, they correct a serious mistranslation by virtue of which a random remark about golden windows in the church is taken to be a symbol of Polish obsession with Jewish gold. Another difficulty in interpreting the scene arises from the fact that witnesses possess local knowledge, impossible to retrieve now. On a side note, Sendyka and Heidel argued that the interpreter becomes another protagonist in the film while her decisions and or translation mistakes may alter the meaning of a given scene. Polish critics are trying to undermine a hierarchy of witnesses established by Landsman, in which Polish bystanders serve only to illustrate a preconceived interpretation of the past. Listening to their voices makes it possible to decolonize Landsman's perspective by reintroducing the heretofore ignored voices of the local bystanders. However, to give some credit to the interpreter, in the first scene retranslated for the study in question, bystanders refer almost in unison to the difficulty in seeing what was going on uh, with the Jews. In order to have full effect, the miss or non-translated entrances would have to be reintroduced into the film, a gesture which is unlikely as Landsman insisted on using the French dialogue list as the basis for uh, translations. Um, and now the third presentation about um, uh, Landsman's Shoah. 
Suvais and Dominic Williams rediscover unused location footage from the film, heretofore largely ignored part of the Shoah treasure trove. Jennifer Casanova's Herculean effort to disentangle the actorial myth and the reality captured in the unused footage pays limited attention to location shots. Following Lanzmann's approach to the recorded material in which spoken narrative, either at historical sites or places evocative of them, is more important, in my opinion, than empty location shots. Weiss and Williams choose a few vistas from Łódź, um, the Łódź Kaliska train station and passageways in Bałuty as an allusion to um, the past. And yet Lanzmann's decision to skip Paula Biren's story about the Łódź ghetto rendered these shots useless for uh, the film. However, as they argue, these shots are not simply useless. I mean, there is a lot to read from them. Uh, so they are nothing but empty, as they are rich in symbolic details. Now I move on to the second site uh, discussed by um, Sue Weiss and Dominic Williams. The former Belgian death camp, shown briefly in the documentary, was not filmed with the same attention to detail as other locations. The camera didn't cross the gate of the former camp, filming from the outside. If I were to make an educated guess about the reasons for this glaring omission, I would say that Belzec was the only former camp with no survivors to talk to, the only survivor who gave his testimony about the camp, namely uh, Rudolf Reder, passed away in 1968, um, five years before Lanzmann came with the idea of making his documentary about, um, about the Holocaust. And I think that the previous lack of attention to location shots in the documentary may stem from taking Lanzmann's octorial power over interpretations of his documentary at face value. So scholars would assume that interviews are more important than location shots. To sum up, new scholarship on Claude Lanzmann's Shoah capitalizes, in my opinion, on two developments. First, access to outtakes, or as Jennifer Casanave puts it, the unused footage, and the decolonizing agenda of Polish scholars. Scholars point out how Lanzmann arrived at the final version of the documentary at the cost of necessary distortions or omissions, but they also treat the outtakes as a source material. In Poland, scholarship on the outtakes or the documentary itself is meant to redress the imbalance in the presentation of the Polish witnesses uh, slash bystanders. By this token, Polish bystanders can be heard in their own voices rather than as projections of filmmakers' imagination. In a way, by selling the outtakes um, to the Holocaust Museum uh, in DC, Lanzmann imperiled his octorial myth, simultaneously making it possible to perceive Shoah not only as an edited masterpiece, but also as an archive in the making. Last but not least, undermining Lanzmann's grip on the interpretation of testimonies gives some power back to his interviewees. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, would uh, the presenters uh, like to respond to, 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 the, to Thomas' comments directly? We can't hear you. Uh, Dorota Głowacka, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, I think you, now you can, I, I think now, now we should hear you. Could you say something, Dorot? Jeszcze nadal nie ma.
We are waiting for uh, technical support. Uh, I, I think, uh, Dorota, I think, um, Professor Govatska, I think your uh, the, the support set your micro is off. That if that it's sort of on your side, if you could try to turn it on. Uh oh. Uh, maybe we start with the others, and 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 uh, during this time, the the the, the, the technicians will try to solve the problem. Uh, Roma Sendika, Magda, um, uh, Professor S S uh, Weiss, would any one of you like to respond directly or shall we first collect questions? Uh, Professor Davis, would you? Yes, thank you. Are you, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we yes. are. <laughs> yeah, oh, fantastic, good. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for that response. That was that was great. Really, really interesting and really, really useful. And it took our work in all sorts of really interesting and new directions. I particularly loved the question, who owns testimony? I think that's that's a really useful question and a question that actually provokes a whole lot of new um, thought processes in me about the kind of sociological um, context of testimony and, and the power relations that are sometimes involved in it as well. So I thought that was that was really good. Um, just sort of picking up on one thing that you said about um, testifying and translating as being parallel processes. Yes, of course. I mean, in a sense that they are that, but the interests coincide sometimes of the, the interpreter and the the witness, but sometimes they don't. They both have very, very complex sort of clouds of interests themselves, and very occasionally they can come together um, in a single goal. But occasionally they clash as well. I mean, the, the interpreter's desire to to support the institution or to save their job if they seem to be doing a bad job can be um, can actually really conflict with the witness's desire to to tell their story or to express something that can't really be expressed in the way the court uh, demands. So there are some really complex things to think about kind of clashing intentions as well as parallel intentions there too. But uh, thank you, you gave me a load to think about. Okay, I, I was told that, uh, that your micro, Professor Grovatska, should already function. So maybe try to say something. <laughs> Can you can you hear me? Yes, now? we can. Yes, we okay, can. Okay, wonderful. The wonders and uh, mysteries of technology. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just really really thrilled to be part of this conversation, and thank you, Tomek, for your comments. It kind of uh, brings to mind also strange questions because you refer to all of us as Polish scholars, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm a Polish scholar. Okay, and and I'm not just saying it in jest. I'm kind of doubly hyphenated Polish Jewish Canadian, and I think it's a very peculiar location vis a vis both Lanzmann's film and the locations in which that film is filmed. And uh, I, I think it's important to actually bring those perspectives uh, where we are situated in our specific locations. I noted it in my paper. Uh, and kind of and our affective investments right in in those places and in those languages so I was trying to somewhat bring it out in my paper but I also think it should be part of our further work on this film um, a, a lot of things that come to mind but one is that uh, well the question if we debunk deconstruct Lanzmann's film in our future work, what remains of that film? Like, what is the status of Lanzmann's film Shoah in our future oh. work as we kind of depart further and further from the film in our work? And uh, maybe it wasn't explicit in my paper, but my position is that when I talk about co-witnessing and I focused on uh, the Jewish and Polish co-witnesses as well as the location as an instance. Uh, I, I think of, of all these actors actually, again, of which I think in terms of agency, right? Like the site as an agent, the raspberry bush as an agent, uh, there is like a rabbit in one of the outtakes and uh, then Simon Srebnik like falls on four knees and imitates the movements of a rabbit. You know, these are all co-witnesses. But I also think about Lanzmann as a co-witness and the, the translator as a co-witness. It's a very complex uh, co-witnessing 
uh, kind of multivocal universe. So I, I am, I don't know how we can kind of reassemble that complex picture, but I think I think it's a, it would be a great loss if we were to move away from Lanzmann as this, you know, puppet master that obscured, you know, the the status of Polish witnesses and the translator as a kind of traditore traditore that that again uh, also excise the Polish testimony. So I would like to pay attention to this complexity and just enrich it. Um, just one other thing about Srebrnik is that in that very location at the site of the camp, like the whatever headquarters, he speaks to different people in different languages, right? Like, so he speaks in Polish and at one point his testimony is translated into French in the other outtake, it is not. There's like no translator as if Lanzmann were not listening to it. That's a different dynamic. Then in the same location, he speaks with Lanzmann in German, but then there is another outtake not far from that site where he speaks uh, to Lanzmann in Hebrew and there is a translator from Hebrew. So, you know, there is this kind of polylingual situation with the same witness that informs, you know, how he reacts with the location, how he reacts, interacts with the other witnesses. So, this is just so rich, so complex, and how, how can we not lose sight of the immensity, multi-layered uh, perspective of this, uh, uh, I will call it speech act. And I'm saying it just one last thing that I wanted to say, that all of these uh, moments of speech, I think of them also as performative speech acts that, that do things. They do things to the other interlocutors. They do things to the locations. And as you know, some scholars of performative speech acts have said, they also often have unintended or infelicitous consequences. I stopped myself. <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Weiss, would you uh, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I just also like to thank Tomek for those really interesting comments. Um, and the, the thing that really stuck in my mind was the last thing that he said, which was that the existence of the archives imperils the authorial myth. And I thought that was a really interesting point because you could see it in that way or you could see it in the other way is actually supporting it that everything is a revelation about what the authorial goal might have been which I suppose supports the, the really ambiguous nature of the outtakes themselves because they're not discards they're exclusions that were kind of waiting for Lanceman maybe to then make something else out of them um, so I thought that was a really interesting way to view it that um could no doubt do with more commentary um so thanks for all your really great thoughts i've got lots of notes from them here uh, uh, roma and magda heidel would you um uh, unless uh, uh, dominic would have wanted to add something because it uh, uh, refers to the same paper Maybe you can say what you want and then we can move All on. All right. Um, uh, ah, sorry, thanks from me. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes, I, I think so. Thank okay. Th th thanks for the commentary from me as well. And probably Roma has a different set of uh, remarks to add than uh, myself because we work from these two directions. I work from translation studies. She. Uh, does from from memory studies, but I was also very much inspired by the question of who aims, uh, who owns um, uh, testimony, and I think in the case of Shoah, it's Lanzmann who owns them, and in this sense, he um, I wouldn't say that he's a puppet master, but he makes this testimony work um, the way he wants it to work, and. Uh, 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 Tomek also also mentioned the the fact that the interpreter is seen as a character in the film. Um, as well as um, uh, this voice from from the other reality or from outside the film. Well, I think this is also very complicated because the uh, the interpreters uh, were also 
put into a special position by Landsman and uh, he, the, her or, or, or their positions in, in uh, respect to languages and to uh, scenes and to the relationships is, is far from obvious and is very far from what uh, Peter was talking about when he, when he mentioned interpreters as professionals. Um, we don't have time to go too deep into it, but I think that um, when we speak about our attempt uh, at looking at the, test the Polish testimonies and the translations as a uh, deconstru an act of deconstructing of Landsman's film, I, I wouldn't quite agree. I don't think it's a question of deconstructing this material. I think it's a question of looking at it uh, through the lens of, I mean, first of all, through the lens of translation, which is a completely different perspective than than any um, uh, of the ones that were used uh, um, in 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 Shoah scholarship, but also to see the opacity of the communication in it, not to see it as a straightforward act of telling. Uh, about experiences or referring to experiences or giving facts. Um, I think the um, what is for me personally, what is so interesting in it, it's that nothing is transparent in this communication. Everything needs uh, 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 delving into and, and, and looking at in, in much more detail. And I think uh, what, what really fascinated me in, in uh, Peter Davis's uh, um, presentation is the, co the concept of um, multilinguality uh, and something that we could perhaps uh, name after Emily up to the translation zone. So translators do not work on a borderline, like it's like a line, like a, like a definite divide, but they work somewhere in the middle of this mixed, messy, area where things are not uh, clearly divided they are they are mixed rather than divided um and and i think that the um the the, the poles who speak in helmno also uh, even in this little passage that we've shown also uh, give uh, testimony to the fact that the linguistic uh, uh, reality was uh, um, th that the language of the reality was 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 plural was uh, perhaps there were different languages for different situations, different language for different speakers, and different language for different emotions. Um, on top of that is something that we were not able to discuss in detail, is the special kind of Polish that they use in order to become more sophisticated in the eyes of the, of the person from outside. So I, I don't think it's the question of deconstructing of Lanzmann's film as a source or as a, as a material, but rather to see the opacity of what is going on as far as language use and translation use within it is uh, concerned. Um, Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, would uh, Dominic Williams or Roma Sendika also like to add something or comment? Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe Dominic first and then Roma. Yep, okay. No. Mm -hmm. We hear you. Okay, um, right. If I, I speak first, yeah. Um, thanks, Tomek, for those comments. They were they were really uh, interesting and um, very very helpful. Um, I suppose just just a few um, comments about what do we think of of what Shoah is? Well, I mean, it, it's a work of art, right? It's not a mm. it's not a documentary. You never said it was a documentary. It's a work of art, and and that um, sequence about Belgets. Uh, may not be the best representation of what Belgets looked like in 1979, but it's a way of signifying death, right? It's a way of signifying silence. And in that, in the film, it's incredibly powerful and it's incredibly effective. But I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, it is what Lanzmann said it was. It's a work of art that he's constructed and they talk about it. You know, he and his uh, editors talk about it as a thing that they constructed. And they weren't, you know, they weren't concealing that from us. Um, you know, the, the 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 work that Nick Chair and I have, have done on um, Philip Muller's testimony, where you know you see that sentences are produced that Muller never said by splicing together words. You know, even things like numbers, right? Accurate numbers that Muller actually said. But okay, 
you know, you get Muller saying in voiceover 3,000 when he's, those are two separate things that are spliced together. Um, but that's what um, Lonsman Mann and Ziva Postek said they were doing all, all the time, right? I mean, they both have accounts when that, where they're saying that that's what they did. Um, so, you know, I think to, in part, we just have to acknowledge that, you know, that they did what they said they did. I think there's another thing, which is that then Lonsman uses the, the film as to say, right, this is the understanding of the show that we need of the Holocaust that we need to buy into. This is the understanding that we have to have of these sites. This is the understanding of, of Poland as it was at the time. And that's something that we need to be skeptical about. But um, I, I guess that, that would be my position that, you know, like any work of art, it's a major work of art about, about the Holocaust, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's the final word on it. Um, <laughs> and just to say on what um, Tomek, um, said about the, the, the choices in filming Belgium. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think you're absolutely right that because there is no survivor to interview, then it's not a place that they can spend much time, uh, that they think of spending much time filming. But don't forget, of course, he did interview Jan Karski, who believed, and at the time that Lonsman interviewed him, he believed as well that he had been at Belgium. Now, it, it looks perhaps as though in that interview, uh, Lonsman is not getting what, he, what he, uh, he wants from Karski on that, because obviously it doesn't fit fit in the final film. But I mean, there, I think there might have been something in mind as, okay, we could do something with Karski, and then we've got Josef Oberhauser. And so, I mean, there, there might have been other ways to approach it, um, even if there wasn't a survivor. But it, I just I just don't think it, it worked out. That might be a way to think about it. Uh, Tomasz, would you like to uh, add something or respond? Or should we? Roma. Okay, so Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Roma. I'm very, Roma. I'm very, I'm very sorry. I didn't really didn't want to forget you. <laughs> sorry, Roma. Please. All right. So perhaps only a brief remark. I'm told what actually I, I wanted to point out that the discourse is language precedes us. So the co-owner or co-creator, co the, the, the power beyond fashioning the testimonies. Of course, that what precedes us. So we, the power of of discourse, which is school language, TV interview language that was also perhaps somehow somehow internalized by those who gave the testimonies because they were standing in front of the camera, which was for them a format they could rec recognize from the television. Uh, and of course, they were using standard Polish, uh, trying to suppress uh, local dialect, and also they were like responding to, to wartime language. So there, there are like frames of conditioning the testimony and beyond those frames are uh, like actants or uh, agencies that need to be included and and uh, and taken into consideration where we try to understand and interpret it. Uh, but to respond to um, something that Dorota already mentioned, uh, Tom mentioned uh, that Polish scholars have some kind of uh, approaches or agenda uh, towards the, towards um, Shoah. I think that one one approach is the, definitely re rescuing the uh, the sentences, the the uh, enunciations by bystanders because it's important because bystander studies start late in around 2000 and we have really a uh, scarce uh, number of of uh, video testimonies. We do have transcriptions of very early uh, trials, court trials. Nevertheless, we don't have uh, video testimonies. Probably uh, Lanzmann's set is one of the richest and one of the earliest we have. Uh, so it's, it's, and this will be studied and definitely will gain more and more attention. But something that came to my mind uh, listening to the Tuesday discussion in Azrieli Foundation when I listened to Francine Kaufmann, uh, that was a uh, translator from Hebrew. She said that uh, it was difficult for her to translate someone who actually had difficulties in speaking Hebrew because that was not his or her first language uh, mm. because the first language was Polish. So actually Polish, Polish scholars, what they could also do is to re-listen to testimonies given by those whose first language was Yiddish and Polish and listen for the, you know, the, the, inscriptions kind of you know uh palimpsest uh representation of polish mindsets polish sayings mm -hmm. uh polish sentences etc etc so actually we have to listen to everything what could have been said in polish but never has been thanks 
Uh, Peter Davis, do you you wanted to add something? I was no, no, no? okay. No. Uh, Tomek. Uh, um, okay, so I mean that was th this whole remark about Polish scholars was due to brevity of my um, responses and. Um, but I cannot agree more uh, with Roma about native speakers of uh, Polish watching um, Lanzmann's, um, Lanzmann's show. Uh, there are some earlier audiovisual testimonies uh, showing uh, Polish prisoners of um, Auschwitz-Birkenau. And uh, there is even a documentary film from the, from the 1960s. So there are some examples of Poles speaking in Polish about um, about the Holocaust. So, um, okay. Uh, Dorota said that Lanzmann used different languages with uh, uh, Srebnik, and I think that was uh, Lanzmann's strategy of closing the gap to witnesses. He would do certain things to make witnesses do what he wanted, and uh, Quite often, he was really kind to his witnesses. So when it comes to his um, characterization as a puppet master, I think this is something that appears from the edited uh, film. And when you watch the outtakes, it turns out that uh, very often he was uh, he was kind to um, uh, to his witnesses, well because he wanted to um, well retrieve something. But I think that this kind of self characterization as uh, of Landsman as as a puppet master is something that he presents in the film. And this is something that uh, many people take for granted. And um, mm. uh, Sue Weiss asked about what are we supposed to do with Landsman's film after we watched um, the outtakes? And I think that when we watch the outtakes, it's obvious that we are adding to the film. So we learn more about Lanzmann's thought process and so on and so forth. But if we look at this film from the perspective of, I would say, modern documentary filmmaking, we could say that Lanzmann was less than honest with some many witnesses in, uh, in his film. Um, are we ready to be okay with that? I guess it depends uh, on uh, who is asking this um, uh, this question. And uh, to Magda Heidel's remark um, about Landsman owning uh, testimony in uh, in the film, I mean, it depends what we mean. I mean, he sold testimony to uh, to another institution, reserving some uh, some rights. But however, he was. Uh, working with not only with translators but with a host of assistants yeah. but he presented the film as his own masterpiece kind of mm -hmm. pretending that all these people uh, who helped him along the way uh, well disappeared or, or did not um, exist at least this is um, an impression I got from uh, reading Jennifer Cazenave's book, mm -hmm. that um, that was something that uh, that he wanted to uh, to uh, to obscure. And uh, when it comes to Dominic's uh, comment about uh, Shah being um, a work of art, um, well, it's absolutely uh, it's absolutely true. But on the other hand, it seems to me that we can still watch it as a documentary. I mean, we don't have to abide by his um, words saying, well, this is a work of art and this is the only perspective you are allowed to, uh, mm -hmm. to have. So in my opinion, I'm really happy that uh, people are watching the outtakes. I'm really happy that um, speakers of some underrepresented languages um, are watching 
the film for translations or um, or mistranslations. I think it does not subtract from the value of the film, but rather it shows Lanzmann's project in all its complexity. Uh, thank you very much. I could you tell me, because I'm a bit lost, how much time do we still have? Support team, bitte. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The clock was running, but yeah, it but disappeared. It's, it's disappeared. We are <laughs> timeless. <laughs> 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 Sorry? Okay, that's fine. Okay, so we have another 10 minutes and I will just for a very short time open the floor for a broader discussion. And one question would be by Małgorzata Pakier and she is asking foremost uh, Roma Sendika and Magda Hedl, but I think that the, the, this question would also be that it addressed to other people speakers who spoke about Lanzmann and she writes that you're interpreting the language and behavior of the interviewees from the perspective of their roles as the Holocaust uh, witnesses. What uh, do you think about including a, soci a sociological perspective of the very situation of an interview in the particular historical and social political context of the uh, 70s or uh, the 80s? I think this was already a bit mentioned mm -hmm. by uh, in, in our previous discussion. Maybe I would add to this two more questions. Uh, one would be um, what um, I was thinking, because I understood what Professor Gowatska said, that um, mm, this for Landsman it, it is form f foremost sort of an estrangement in terms of uh, me and the Poles. The Poles are the others. The Poles are those to be colonized, or the Poles are those uh, uh, um, <clears throat> those, uh, well, primitives in a way. I was wondering if there is also a sort of um, estrangement because of the social position. So he mostly talks, not only, but mostly talks to peasants. While, uh, as I remember well, uh, for example, when he, uh, he is interviewed with Karski, it looks quite different. Is it not only about... Um, whatever nationality, but also about being uh, talking to peasant as a Paris intellectual. Uh, this would be one question. And another thing is what was already is mentioned in Maugosha's uh, um, um, question and was also a bit mentioned in uh, the previous discussions, but in how far you would say it's a sort of lost in translation uh, and in far, far it was a sort of deliberate neglect or uh, mistranslation or neglect or distortion by Landsman to achieve a specific goal. And why I'm asking, because I wonder what would be if you would include in your analysis also the sort of economic and practical aspects of making a, such a documentary. For example, did mm. he, uh, maybe he did not did do additional translations for the Polish subtitles because he didn't have enough money and so he had this one <laughs> translation and this was sort of enough. <laughs> yes, I mean, th th this is a simple uh, example, but what is about practicalities of making such a film, the sort of conditions? What is really intentious and what is because it just happened? Um, this would be all for now, I think. I yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, um, it, it, I, I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, practic practical questions are very important in our project. So we started also with, with, with mentioning some of the practical difficulties, like, for example, how to squeeze all this linguistic material into the film. It would be absolutely impossible to have subtitles uh, um, uh, um, which will include all that is being said, right? You just cannot do that. There are rules for subtitle making and it's just as many letters or, or, or characters at, at, at one uh, screen uh, and not more. Um, so I don't know about the budget for, for screening Shoah and the money that uh, uh, possibly could have been there for the Polish subtitles, but I think it, um, it, it has to do with the uh, pr practical question of what, who is the uh, receiver, who is the imagined receiver of, the, of this film work of art or documentary, whatever we call it, and who is the 
subject of the material, who, who, who is counted as a material rather than as a subject. All right. So, so it's, it's a ob objectifying part of the, um, of, well, many of the people that, that uh, <laughs> uh, appear in the film. I'm, I don't want to go into this kind of ethical and judgmental uh, discussion here, but just to say that, of course, the social status of these people is extremely important. And I think that the, the, the whole image of Polish countryside as this backwards uh, area where uh, um, people are, well, peasants, you know, it's a word that describes a social class that has just vanished and was vanishing in Poland very soon uh, uh, um, so so it's 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 an it's an image of a special uh, uh, landscape with the objects with the human objects in it um, but uh, um, so so we and and in our analysis this last remark in our analysis we we uh, uh, have a lot of uh, um, we put a lot of stress on the sociolinguistic analysis on the dialectal uh, aspect of the language not to just to to point out that these are these people are speaking dialects uh, rather than the standard polish the question what standard polish is is open as well uh, but to see how all this works as a factor in creating the effect that Lanzmann's, Lanzmann uh, uh, aims at. Um, so that, that much for me. Dorota mm. Głowacka? Uh, if, I, if I may just uh, throw a couple of things in, two specifically. One is regarding the way Lanzmann was interviewing witnesses in 78 and the kind of understanding we have about the dynamic and tools of the interview today. Uh, I'm not saying it's a much more sophisticated view, I, but perhaps it is much more complex. Uh, and uh, we kind of judge these present day standards of doing interviews back onto how Lanzmann was doing them in 78 quite often. I'm just thinking of the Shoah Foundation, for instance, even if you look at the Shoah Foundation interviews like in the early 1990s, and then how they do the interviews today, how they code these interviews, et cetera. These are very different tools. So I think we need to keep that in mind as well. Uh, another thing is, and that's something we touched on, <coughs> excuse me, during the Azrieli conference, some of us were part of, um, and uh, we commented on the need to introduce an intersectional analysis that takes into account other axes of uh, the participants' identities. And we've paid so much attention to languages and kind of ethnicities. But then, as Zofia, you said, class comes into play. Uh, Peter mentioned gender. For me, gender, I am a scholar of like gender theory. So that, to me, uh, is extremely important. And it plays out in Shoah in, in multiple ways, where he excludes female testimony, but all of his translators are female. So we now have the tools, kind of socio-political, ideological, theoretical, uh, and uh, psychoanalytic to introduce these intersectional multiple lenses. And I think that can become part of our uh, exploration of this film going forward. Would any, we have still maybe three minutes, two minutes. So maybe uh, Roma? You wanted to so only briefly about the uh, possibility to uh, add sociological study, and I cannot agree more. It's absolutely needed because we need to know what uh, this group of people uh, was uh, accustomed to, what they were actually experiencing. Was anyone interviewing them before? Were they uh, answering uh, calls for uh, wartime or post-war memoirs? Uh, Definitely, there's one evident thing that is right away evident. We don't know their names. No one came back asking who was actually part of this interview. So with so much of interest, mm -hmm. of scholarly worldwide interest in the scene in Helmina, no one did this field trip, trip to ask families and possibly also still someone living 
what do people remember? I think that Piotr Litka, a, a, a director of documentary films, tried to make such a such an endeavor. Perhaps Tomek was that knows something more. But I think this is an evidently missing research. We we don't know what these people actually thought, thought about the whole filming about Landsman. Uh, well, the, Barbara Janicka, when she gave interviews to the translator, Polish translator, she said that uh, Landsman was inviting everyone for the um, premiere and uh, promising coming to promising invitations uh, mm. to those who gave interviews. He never, of course, fulfilled this this promise. But you know, there's there's a long list of questions you could ask those people who could remember the filming perhaps someone still is there, still there there definitely are families that might know something so this you know ethnographic anthropological sociological study of this group is definitely to be done okay uh... Yes. <laughs> uh, may, may I just yes. make one very short observation that uh, uh, Peter discussed uh, the uh, the trial where the um, witness is actually very uh, uh, carefully identified, um, while the translator or the interpreter is um, seems to be seen as invisible. Uh, if I may put that in this paradoxical way. Here, we, the situation is different. We know the interpreter and we know her identity. We, there were interviews with her, but we don't know the identity of the witnesses, which is quite striking. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very and to add to that, yes. we don't know the roles because we don't know who was the teacher in, this, in, this, uh, in, this, in the local school, who was a representative mm. of the uh, local party, uh, because there must be someone, uh, Mr. Kantorowski, who's uh, coming up yeah. in front of the of the whole group. Who was this person? What was his role in this group? So there's like a bunch of questions still unanswered. Mm. Uh, Peter Davis, I think you wanted to. Just to respond to the thing about the anonymity of the interpreters, it's actually quite remarkable in this trial uh, documentation. It's a very detailed archive. Um, it's heavily sponsored by the German state. It's very high profile, has this UNESCO status. But you can't find information about the interpreters. You know their names, mm -hmm. right? And that's mm -hmm. basically it. Um, I've dug through archives around that, the ones that aren't digitized when I was able to go before COVID struck. Um, it's very hard to find biographical information about these interpreters, though they clearly obviously have very interesting biographies. Now. Mm. Uh, there was, but there's one woman that we know more about, and that is this Vera Kapkayev, who translated Russian, Polish, and German, and she has an absolutely fascinating background um, as a, a, a sort of a, a white Russian emigre family who grew up in um, Vilnius, then became bilingual in Polish and Russian, and then moved to Germany at some point after the war, and then became an interpreter. She's really, really fascinating. Um, but the only reason we know anything about her is that she challenged the bureaucracy. She actually applied for a pay rise as an interpreter. And there's a whole correspondence in the archive about her explaining how difficult this job is that she's doing, and therefore she deserves to be paid at a higher rate. Um, and that, of course, tells us a lot about how interpreting and translation are valued sociologically. And I agree, incidentally, with Roma, more sociology, please. We need more of that kind of stuff, definitely, in these analyses. But it's only when interpreters stand up and challenge the conditions in which they're working that we know anything about them in fact they make themselves mm. visible and they actually risk they take risks to do that professional risks uh okay thank uh, mm, sorry but i was uh, so, i'm very sorry but i was just told that we should know that we are beyond <laughs> the time now and i have on my agenda still summarizing the, the session but i think i will give this up and it would be difficult to summarize anyway so I leave you with the thoughts and hope that there will be more occasions for further discussions. And, and, and thank you for the very interesting presentations and the comments and the discussion. And I would just uh, like to remind everybody that this is not the end of, the, of our conference and it will continue next week with sessions five and six. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That was fascinating. Thank you.